Here we go to pump you up. <laughs> welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Capital Markets Day. And I have to say a big thank you for the investment in time that you're putting with us. We know it's a, it's a big afternoon. It's good to see people in the flesh, I have to say as well. Welcome as well to the ones uh, who are online uh, around the world. And more importantly, welcome uh, and thank you for also uh, having been on the journey with us. Uh, many of you have been on the journey uh, for many years, all the way since 2013, if I'm not mistaken. So thanks for that. We have a pretty packed and ambitious agenda, as you would expect uh, from us. First of all, John and myself were, uh, will probably level playing field to share where we are at as a story at Keywords right now, including the very latest development. We'll then spend a bit of time going through the last six months and what we've been up to. Also a chance for me to discover the business, to discover the team, but also we've been in action pretty quick. You will then see quite a few of the five work streams that we've been talking about pretty much since day one and how we're igniting growth with those. In the room today, you have a lot of key audience, um, so you'll get the chance hopefully to meet them. Some of them will be on stage with us as well to share the story. And you even have a couple of clients that we're very privileged to have with us as well. Uh, uh, John will do a session with Nuno on M&A. You may have seen as well an acquisition that we announced uh, overnight, and then uh, we'll uh, wrap it up by sharing what that means in terms of financials and in terms of growth model overall. So jumping straight in, those are the key themes that we'd like to touch on uh, throughout the afternoon today. And I hope you'll be as excited as we are about each of them. The first one is we are market leading position as the go-to provider of technical and creative solutions. We'll try to really bring that to life uh, fully. You'll then get to see through some numbers as well what our reach how much our reach has been extending over the past few years in terms of breadth and global services that we have. We'll touch as well on the track record that we have on both organic growth and acquisition, which I think you know us for, uh, and how much we are well placed into the buoyant uh, video game market as well, uh, with a few adjacencies we'll touch on as well, I think without getting too far away from our core. Then we'll spend the bulk of the time on going through those five work streams and the strategic priorities that we have defined, uh, really strategy into, into action uh, before uh, closing on the ability to deliver uh, sustained compounding growth and giving, probably sharing some guidance as well as, as we see it for uh, the years ahead. So if I take the very first one, a few uh, numbers to, to bring it all to life. We are the number one into our space. We have eight service lines now across full end-to-end -end across the different services that we have. I'll go through them to share the very latest uh, development that we've seen there. We're in 23 countries uh, uh, with 70 studios. I got the chance to visit about 30, 35 of them uh, by now. Uh, a lot of great entrepreneurs around the network. We just reached our 11,000th keywordian. When I joined as a reference uh, only a few months ago, we were 9,500. So we've been growing uh, quite uh, strongly also on the talent front, uh, covering 50 languages. You'll hear from my localization team uh, shortly. We serve 23 of the top 25 uh, publishers. We're very proud of that, uh, including all of the mobile, uh, top 10 mobile partners. Uh, then John and I will do uh, the exercise to share a bit more about the TAM as we see it. We operate in a 200 plus uh, billion market. Uh, we see our market specifically as being roughly 35 billion, uh, of which 11 billion is being outsourced right now, but growing pretty fast. Uh, we'll share a bit more details about that. And then, as you know, we are roughly half a billion uh, sales with a very good cash generation and flow through in terms of profitability. I, I think this one I won't spend too much time. You've seen it at the year end, but I think it's worth emphasizing. 37% growth year over year last year, of which 19% uh, was organic. You've seen 56% year over year improvement in terms of adjusted PBT, uh, reaching 16.8%. Uh, uh, so partly favored as well because of COVID, less travel, uh, as you know, but well north of the 15% uh, that we are targeting. This one, I'll spend a bit more time on. Those are the eight service lines that we effectively uh, cover. If I start on the top right, you get to see our game development capabilities, which, interestingly, is fairly new within Keywords. We have only really started to invest in this over the past three, four years in earnest. We now have about close to 20 studios in that range, 1,500 engineers. I think that's really a very strong strength that we can leverage more. We have an art services with about 2,000 artists across the globe with some very big names in terms of studios that I think uh, some of our clients can probably uh, testify about. We have then an audio service, uh, which is where the magic of bringing the emotions of the voice and the voice actors into the games really comes to life. 
Uh, you've seen a few in the video at the entry of the students we have, including one here in London uh, called Liquid Violet. Uh, we then have a set of uh, post-production services from functional uh, testing. Some of you were with us on the road a couple of years ago in Montreal, where you got to see the scale of, of those operations, uh, if you remember. I see a few heads nodding. Uh, but also localization and localization testing, again, covering 50 languages. And more recently, uh, we have had some recent additions to the family, especially in terms of marketing services, some studio heads, uh, including founders of the studios, uh, in here with us. We have about eight studios now, mostly in London and in LA. Uh, but also, you'll hear from a bit later today from the team of how much this fits with our player support capabilities, where at the end of the day, that's really where the rubber hits the road and where we get to spend time and meet the players at a fairly massive scale. I was touching on the scale and the reach that we have. As you can see, 23 countries, 70 studios. But why does this matter in the first place? And I think, first of all, it matters because that's what our customers are expecting from us. That's what our customers really favor, to be able to have an offering where we can be co-located, we can be located very close to where they are uh, geographically. But at the same time, if they want to have the flexibility to deploy resources very rapidly around the world, to be able to do that. And having the flexibility on, on an onshore, offshore model is also very compelling for many of our clients. It also matters because we are all hunting for talent. And having the ability to have anchors at many places around the world allows us to, be, to have that proximity, to be close to them, to really understand the local school, the local university, the pool of talents, and to be able to really tap into those. This one is one that I think it's fair to say many of us are very uh, proud of. Uh, we have the chance to serve the who's who uh, in the industry. Uh, again, 23 of the top 25 publishers, uh, the top 10 uh, on the mobile side, you'll recognize all of the names in here. Uh, but what we have shared more recently has also been how many are starting to work with us on multiple service lines. We now have 130 plus clients among the 900 we have that are using three or more of our service lines. If you were to do the same in the top 10, you'll see most of them using six or more of our service lines uh, right now. We also don't have a strong dependency on individual customers. The top five account for roughly 30 uh, percent, including with some of the recent consolidation that we see in the market right now. And probably the most important one to me is what you see at the bottom right here. It's, and that's really important in terms of quality of earnings, but more importantly in terms of relationship with our clients. We see more and more sticky relationship, where we have very high level in terms of repeat businesses. Part of it is due to the nature of the relationship that our studio have. Uh, with uh, our, our clients, with our partners. You'll hear from, uh, about that a bit later. Uh, part of it is also where we have some preferred supplier relationship now that are starting to build up. An example of that would be, in many cases, we don't necessarily know which title we're going to work on on a studio level, but we know that we're going to be lined up whenever a new title comes up in terms of testing, for example. Now, in addition to that, uh, we, looked, uh, we did an analysis recently to look at how much purely evergreen do we really have. And we see an extra 30 to 40 percent of evergreen businesses, mostly into mobile. Uh, an example of that would be uh, also the work we do with Fortnite and Epic, where we have been with them, one of our studio called High Voltage Software, 130 devs and artists. And we've been with them pretty much since inception from 2017 uh, at Fortnite itself. And one thing we're really investing on, and you'll see some example of that hopefully today, is how do we really embed ourselves into the workflows of our partners? How can we really be true partners in that? When you take all this in, we estimate that we have about 80% of the revenues we have from one year to the next that is uh, uh, recurrent. Now, I'll spend a bit of time on this one, because this one is one that really is close to, to many of our hearts, I think, and I'm speaking on behalf of many of the key wardens here and certainly matters for me uh, big time for the future. We are a responsible business, we are proud to be, uh, and, but we have much more that we want to keep investing into that as well. Uh, we have an ESG committee that is in place, led by George Forney. Uh, we have John, myself, uh, a part of that committee, uh, something we take very seriously. We have five key pillars that you see on the left-hand side, and probably the most important one, ultimately, is the one at the, at the very top there, in terms of people, uh, with 11,000 key audience, including the DNAI uh, agenda. A few to make it more tangible. Uh, you may have seen recently a rating moving from uh, triple B to A, but we still have a long way to go on that. I'm sure it's going to take years, but that's an investment we want to make. Uh, you may have seen as well that we have joined an organization called Women in Games. And uh, I'm, I see Trina Marshall, who is in the audience. Sorry to pick on you, Trina. But 
China is one of our ambassadors as part of Women in Games. Overall, they have about 500 ambassadors around the world. We all recognize we have to do much more as an industry overall. And Trina Kani invited me to an event a couple of weeks ago where I got to join in for three, four hours. It was striking to see five, six of our female leaders really stepping up, sharing their careers, the evolution as well, and, and influencing, quite frankly, the industry more broadly as part of that. So expect us to see much more investment in that one, uh, certainly. Uh, we're also investing into our group environmental policy. We're still early, to be very candid. Uh, right now, we're at a stage where we have set up the type of standard we want to get it, uh, but then we're benchmarking each of our 70 studios around the world to see where we're truly at, and I would expect next year to see more progress on that front. And one that I think many of us are really very sensitive about is the last one, the hardship fund that we're investing in. Uh, I mean, we had invested into relocation in New Orleans when hurricanes happened. Uh, many of our teams jumped in uh, in India when we had to put vaccines in place, when there was really no effort done for COVID in a proper way. And more recently, probably even closer to home to some extent to all of us, is the uh, crisis in Ukraine where uh, many of our teams stepped in. We doubled the hardship fund. Uh, but even more importantly to me than the fund was to see how much we mobilized with our Polish office, with our Romanian office to really open jobs uh, for Ukrainian refugees. We had talent, so it's also good business to do, but really to bring that to, together in there. Now, I promised uh, uh, to share a little bit more about, about the TAM. So we shared a few numbers at the year end, but we view the market overall being roughly 240 billion. Uh, you may have seen Sony's announcement with Jim Ryan fairly recently sharing those numbers. Uh, we see it is growing at roughly 5%. Depending on the estimate, you see 5 to 8.7% CAGA. Uh, here is, we took IDG as a source and converged very closely to what we've seen at other places. If you double click on that, in our space, very specifically, we see it as being $30 billion. Uh, That's all the content servicing uh, provisions that really happen in that space, of which 11 billion right now happens from third party or outsourcing partners like us. Knowing that I hate the term, I really want to be seen as, as truly a partner uh, at the hip. Overall, if you look at that, uh, we see a roughly 10% CAGA uh, happening in terms of that, that latter number, bringing the market of 35 to effectively 48 billion uh, over the next uh, few years to 2026. And you can see, more importantly, an increasing part of that being the part that really comes into our type of world, as many partners are starting to think more strategically about how do they want to work uh, with uh, partners like us. A little bit more details about that. We looked at it per service line. And what you see on the middle one, for example, you see in audio in general across the industry already hitting 70% being done by uh, external partners on that front. On post-production, you see a bit less, but starting to get it close to the 50% range, which makes a lot of sense. If you are running a set of studios individually, why would you really want to be in player support or into uh, post-production to a large extent when we have the capabilities to deploy the muscle uh, globally that I was hinting to earlier, the ability to have much more flex and probably also more cost-efficient. And then more recent for us on game dev, but where we have done massive investments, where the bulk of the spend also is, you see roughly 17% coming there. But you'll see it will share some structural trend that showcase that we expect this to increase uh, quite a bit over the next few years. Now, what drives this? And that's ultimately, it's really about content. It's really content, content, content. And where you'll see I, I forecast, and many are forecasting, an explosion in that space. Part of it is driven by the new consoles, by the streaming platforms that you see in the market uh, constantly evolving. Uh, you may have a question about COVID. Was, this, was it just a blip during that time? We don't think so. Uh, and we see all the evidence going the other way around right now. A good reminder, and maybe a data point that is important to, to keep in mind, is the gaming industry is the cheapest form of content on a permanent basis. So when you think about discretionary spending from users also having to share with the Netflix, to have to share with the football assignment, etc. Actually, this is the most efficient way as well to really get into entertainment as, as a player or as a, as a person at the end of the day. Uh, also, the AAA consoles, the, the PC games, the next-gen consoles, more and more complexity. You've seen some of the announcement from Apple probably overnight uh, as well, getting more and more capabilities uh, and, and generating more and more quality content in there. I think there are also, below those top three, there are also some probably more subtle ones. And the first one, to me, uh, I really got to appreciate it by spending quite a bit of time with our, with our customers, is how much more complexity there is really in getting a game to market. We're talking about it with James that you'll hear about later today, but often it takes now three, four, five hundred people to get a AAA game over the line. It wasn't the case a few years ago. You could do it with 50 to probably 150 people. It takes a village now to really go and build that 
in a proper way. Uh, at the same time, we're also seeing a very strong growth in gas, in game as a service or games that never ends. Uh, again, you've seen Sony talking about it quite strongly and powerfully a couple of weeks ago. And maybe the best illustration we, that John and I put together on this that is quite simple is, uh, for, this, for those a bit less familiar with gas, is a few years ago you would have titles that are getting ready for Christmas, effectively shipped, and then everything is lined up for that big peak, and then you come back the next season. Versus now, times are really changing, where you get games that effectively never end. You need more and more content to get them on. You have more and more uh, management of it through microtransactions, which completely change the behavioral pattern as well and, and the monetization. And even, I would say, the ability to pass on pricing to some extent in a more subtle way. But this results in much, much more content being needed, fundamentally. And beyond that, you'll hear later on about the investment we're making in live apps, uh, about cross platforms, which we do a lot of quite naturally. And I don't know, and if you see on the complexity piece, if some of you got the chance to play around with uh, Unreal 5, you'll get probably a sense, and the Matrix Awakened, you'll probably get a sense of how much realism you can start putting uh, <clears throat> into those games and, and beyond effectively in there right now. So if I step back, uh, we estimate that, that we're number one in, into our space, the space we were just describing, with roughly three times the size of uh, the next player basically into the space. But it's still very fragmented, and you have many that are more specialized into their own uh, area as such. Now, what I'm taking away from this graph is much more important than that. It's more that we are still only 5% of that 11 billion we're talking about. So that gives you a sense of the runway that is ahead of us to really go and build and invest into the platform uh, to do something quite, quite special over the, next, over the next decade. And on the right-hand side, equally important, is also the fact that we are probably the only one that have the full end-to-end -end offering. This hasn't come easily. This has been probably 10 years in the making with m and with proper investment, the quality of the assets, you'll hear about that from Nuno a little bit later. But that's a very posi uh, special position to be on. So on that note, I'll pass on to John to keep us going. Thank you very much, Bertrand. And it's great to be here today, and particularly to be here in person, which is absolutely fantastic. So just moving on to this chart, this chart really just shows how Keywords has grown and developed over the last eight years since the IPO. From a 16 million revenue business uh, with 370 people, four service lines, into the business it is today, with eight service lines giving us that full end-to-end -end capability across the content cycle, over 10,000 colleagues, I need to update my notes, it's 11,000 apparently, uh, but over 10,000 colleagues, uh, giving us global coverage uh, across 23 <laughs> countries. And it also demonstrates the power of the platform and how it's been built out through M&A. And this, together with the organic growth, has delivered an impressive 47% revenue CAGR over this time. And this chart demonstrates a strong financial track record with a revenue CAGR of 36% over the last four years, uh, with over 10% organic growth each year. And that translates into a profit CAGR of 39% over that same period. So a very strong track record of financial delivery. And this chart shows the importance of M&A in building out keywords into the platform that it is today. It's been a very methodical process that we've been through of building out each service line to get them to a position of scale, get them to a position of global reach, and then we move on to the next one. And the graph on the left-hand side shows um, that uh, since the IPO, we've effectively acquired 300 million euros of revenue, but importantly, that's created the platform that's allowed the business to deliver 200 million of organic revenue growth over that time, and that translates to an average of over 15% a year. And on the right-hand side of the chart, it really shows the track record of delivery that we've had, with over 56 acquisitions, plus the one we did today, so 57 since the IPO, and that averages out at about five to 10 acquisitions or so each year. And this chart sets out how we approach M&A, and we have a session a bit later with Nuno to take you through the way that we approach this in a little bit more detail but it's a pretty well-oiled machine. We do all of our own origination, and at the same time, at any time, we probably have 90 or so opportunities that are on our long list that we're looking at, um, but we're very selective on the ones that we target, and we have a very disciplined approach in terms of how we take a business from due diligence right the way through to the integration process. And this delivers a very, very compelling long-term value creation opportunity, allowing us to build out the platform, which in turn drives the organic growth 
and at pretty attractive valuations. And just building on the chart that Bertrand presented earlier, I think this has created a fantastic platform to build on. We are the clear market leader, with none of our competitors able to offer the full suite of services at scale and globally. We're fortunate to be operating in a large and growing industry and with a TAM of $11 billion that's forecasted to grow even strongly, driven by this continued and meaningful trend towards uh, increasing use of external providers to help deliver content. We're very, very proud to be working with the who's who of the industry, with all of the large publishers. And those relationships are getting more and more sticky and more and more embedded into their working arrangements. But from an investor perspective, uh, we're the picks and shovels of the industry. Uh, and whilst we absolutely love it when our customers' games are successful, we're not quite as exposed to that hit and miss risk that you sometimes associate across the industry. And as I said, we have a very strong track record of delivery, and I think this creates a very exciting opportunity for us to build on over the next few years. So with that, I'm going to pass back to Bertrand. Thank you, John. I think I'll just pause a second on, on this one, because that's an important one, and, and a lot of what is on this slide is really the reason why I joined in the first place. And uh, I think because of that platform that we have in our hands to build on. And I got the chance to spend quite a few hours with um, Andrew Day before starting, and we talked about a lot of topics. We talked a lot about what is really on that slide. As such, he had a lot of uh, really good advice as well going forward. But what really stuck with me, and, and I shared that with a few of you, I have a post-it next, next to my computer at home, um, and his post to stay was actually the, the wisest advice from Andrew, which is, don't mess it up. And I think it's actually very wise. There is really strong relationship, there is really strong brands that we have, there is really strong coordination that has happened, and really a lot of talent across the, across the patch. This being said, I think we also, I'm discovering in space the type of opportunities that we have, and that's where we are going to spend the bulk of the, of the afternoon to, to share about. But the first one is really about a strategic customer relationship. Uh, you'll see, I think we, are, we have a great position, but we're still very tactical and could really bring this to the next level. The second one is all about technology. Uh, to some extent, I don't want to grow to 22,000 talents to double the revenue over the next X number of years. Uh, I really want to make sure that we do that with the right technology investment but also really on behalf of our clients. How can we be more efficient about that? You'll hear a prime example of something we're doing with Microsoft in that type of setup. Some of you have heard me talk about one keyword, and this is something close to my heart. I believe we have an incredible network of entrepreneurs within keywords. This is something I want to protect. We have a few of, of them, a few of us in, in that room. I include myself into there, but at the same time, how do we increase collaboration to make the best of that platform together? We'll talk a lot about talent today and how can we think on a longer term horizon to really tap into that talent that all of us are trying to, uh, to effectively get, get close to. Um, and John will do a small section about adjacencies. And as I said earlier, I don't think we have to depart much from the gaming DNA that we have. And to some extent, we're already do working in some of the adjacencies. It's a question of how much do we want to accelerate that. And finally, we'll spend a bit of time of how the m and is supporting effectively all those activities. So. I'm just going to shift gear a little bit and to go on, on this picture, which is uh, an important one to me. This is, uh, and I think many are, in, are effectively in the room, uh, but this is a journey we started really in earnest on the 3rd of January, where we started those five work streams. But to do that, we mobilized about 50 to 60 of our leaders across keywords. And we assigned 10 to 12 of us each to one of those five work streams I was alluding to earlier. And you'll see what you're going to see later on is really the work uh, of the team. We worked on bi-weekly sprints. I think it's fair to say it has been intense. Uh, on purpose, we put team leaders on each of those work streams by, by norm that were coming from different standpoints and different uh, point of view, some from the studio, some from the functional lines, uh, some coming from the sales team, some coming from a very different starting point. Um, it has been electric in a positive way, but I really also got the chance to get to discover the team as we were doing this. And this picture that you see here on the wall is from May the 3rd, where effectively after five months of work, we ended up actually getting a summit for three days, including our board, very transparently uh, joining us and being uh, participants to, to that exercise, where it all came together and where we brought each of the recommendations, including budget, including the PMO, but in place, and we made a few hard choices as well uh, to make that happen. Now, at that summit, 
uh, I wanted to share a couple of slides that we shared when we started that summit and that event. And we had the three graphs you're going to see next plastered around the world big time. So you could not, I think it's fair to say, you could not ignore them. And the first one was really about the voice of the customer. Uh, personally, I got the chance to visit about 30 of our studios. Uh, more importantly, I met as well uh, 25, most of the 25 of our top customers at different levels, at CXO level, at CEO level. Uh, again, you have some uh, today with us. Uh, I got the chance as well with many of us to go to GDC, to DICE, to really get a, a reality check and also to hear from some of our investors uh, along the way. But this one to me is really important. And essentially the core of it, I won't go in, in details, but you can sense that there is a real strong appetite for partnering. But a, a lot of it is driven by complexity that I was alluding to earlier. And where the partners just are coming to the point where we cannot do it all alone. So where are their partners? We have that end-to-end -end offering where we can do something uh, more systematic together. We did the same with the studios. I really wanted to understand not only by going on premises, but we got a, some surveys out as well to understand of what do our studios really have in mind. And overall, I have to say there is a buzz around the studio when, when you walk around. Uh, there is really something very, very special that I haven't seen in many spaces before. But we don't do everything right. Uh, there are some places where some are asking us to say, look, how can you remove some of the red tapes where you are constraining some of the growth we could have? Uh, I've heard it in spades at different places where we can better organize ourselves. Uh, also in terms of platforms. How can we really have the platforms to get that visibility? How can we, we realize the power of keywords you, that you're talking about, but how can we really get, get the visibility of what's going on and, and raise that collaboration? We did the same uh, with our employees, and there I'm, I'm, I'm proud to share that we, have, we measure NPS regularly, uh, so the Employee Net Promoter Score. We have a, a score that has moved from 22 to 42 over the last year, which I think is a massive, massive jump but we still have a lot to go after. Uh, for example, clearly salaries, packages, the way it's even presented is something that is really top of mind, especially as you would expect in an inflationary uh, world like this. I'm sure we'll talk about that more. But it's much more than that. A lot of it is really about career path. How do we make sure that you give us chances to leverage the global network that we have? How can we have geographic experiences? How can we move from one service line if we have an engineering bent to game development potentially? How do we plan for that? And there was another piece that came very strongly in terms of feedback from the team was, look, Bertrand, we also need to get a sense of purpose, where we have it across keywords overall, but how do we have more something that brings us all together, and this is a good moment to do that. That brings me to the next one, and that's something we did as well at that summit uh, with one of the teams. And there is a word that we're using, and Liz, who is our global market, uh, marketing director, is in the room, and is probably going to, to take me on that because we're still playing with the words. But I like to call it for now, we're game makers and proud to be game makers. And I generally believe that I had sort of an epiphany when walking around with, with John at, at DICE in January, if I'm not mistaken. And I got to realize when meet, meeting many of our partners, many of our clients, I didn't know what, what relationship exactly we had. I was still discovering the business. But how many are relying on us to get their games over the line? How many actually are really relying on the type of resource and the partnerships and the technical ability and even the thought leadership to be able to get to get that done. Um, and actually, I think it's very rare, because when you think about this, how many companies can truly say that if they disappear, if they weren't there, the ecosystem might be quite different? When you think about that for a minute, I think there's really something profound there. And I think we have a chance, we're only at the beginning of that journey, we have a chance to really create something special in that space. Now, some of you may be familiar with the famous flywheel that from Jeff Bezos uh, from 25 years ago, where on a napkin in a bar, he wrote actually pretty much the flywheel strategy of, of Amazon, which he still comes back regularly with. We did the exercise uh, to also look at what could be a flywheel. Do we even have one? Many companies don't. I think we have. I think we have something quite compelling here. Uh, first, we have a strong offer that has been built over the last decade plus. You have seen the type of service lines, the end-to-end -end proposition. That in its own right attracts the best clients, attracts the best title which is not a given, I wouldn't take that for granted, uh, with longer-term relationship, which in its turn attracts some of the best people in the industry and the best targets, as we've seen overnight. People get a choice of where they want to work, and many really want to work in a world where supplies is so much shorter than, than demand, of which company do they really want to work on, and they want to work on the good titles. And then we want to make sure that we have that platform that I'm talking about with John to make sure that we are not just a collection of individual studios, that it really comes together, which then reinforces the offer. And you can see, hopefully, that wheel spinning. But that's our job. Our job, for us in the room key audience, is those five work streams and M&A, 
how do we use this to invest to really get that wheel flying uh, faster? On the right hand side, you see the emphasis on strategic partnership. How do we really embed those long term partnerships truly joined at the hip? On the left hand side, that's why I'm so passionate about technology. And one key word is how do we have that so that we truly have a platform here? Uh, on the bottom, you see the investments that we'll talk about this afternoon at length about talent, 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 and capabilities. Uh, likewise, also with some of the adjacencies we're looking to and deploying our balance sheet and our MA capabilities to be able to, to circulate that. But I'll come back on that wheel, but I think it's a, it's a bit conceptual, but I think it's really an important one, and I don't think everybody gets something like that. Now, this is the, before really digging into it, this is probably the agenda for the rest of this afternoon. Those are the five work streams uh, I was referring to. By the end of that summit, each team came up with three recommendations. No more than that. That's probably as much as we can chew. Uh, many are not rocket science. Many are going to be business as usual fairly quickly. But it was a, a matter of focusing, picking our battles, putting the right resources, putting the right leadership behind, but to be able to really go after it. Uh, we have also put proper PMO, proper resources, proper investment uh, behind to make sure that we can make that happen. We have also taken a three-year approach so that we are not constrained by just going from one year to the next. Where are there places where we need a longer period of time to really go and make a difference basically in those? But again, that's going to be the menu for what's after. So on that basis, taking a breath, we are ready to jump into each of the five. And I'll start to kick off and I'm seeing the first one, which is those strategic partnerships. So to talk about that, I'm just repeating a slide that I just went through. And as you can sense, we're very proud of that. We're very proud, John uh, mentioned it as well, to work with the who's who's in the industry. Uh, we're proud of how many are using multiple of our service lines. But if I'm really honest, when I digged into it, I realized that we have quite a few gaps on that picture. Uh, and I'll start with the bottom, where we did the analysis with one of the Workstream teams to look at it title by title. And then we stepped back and look, we looked at it for the top 25 publishers one by one. And taking the example of Elden Ring, which we are very proud I mean, uh, to, to have contributed to, you can see five of our studios stepping in in those with Bandai Namco. Actually, there are quite a few gaps in there. We didn't contribute in terms of game development. We didn't play in terms of player support. We didn't help on, on FQA versus we knew that this was coming based on the work that we're doing in art on there. So there were some white spaces there. At the same time, if you go under the hood, uh, there was a lot of high-fiving on all what we could have done, we, we have done together, but it wasn't easy. A lot of resources really, really mobilized at the very last minute with some sacrifice in other studios. Uh, we could have also extended to create less frustration from some of our clients to really make sure that we can extend those resources, valuable resources for the long term afterwards. So that's why we started to look from tactical to, to more strategic. What else could we do? How, and that's why we are, we are passionate about that, about how do we secure those resources resource for a longer time? How do we plan better on that? Uh, how do we think about a more cross-line and steward collaboration? When we did the map of the top 25 per service lines, we have quite a few white spaces, player support being an example of that, that we're now uh, properly taking on. You'll hear from James a bit later today about how can we think differently instead of just thinking the next title, uh, whether it's Blood Hunt, whether uh, it's Elden Ring, how can we think all the horizon to 2026? It's a very different way of thinking. It means opening up the pipeline, it means a certain trust to be able to, to really trust us as well to discuss that. And then we can come up with solutions that use the best of keywords more broadly. Uh, and Trina has been one of the architects of that. What I got to appreciate by talking to some of the CXO and CEOs is also that actually there are many more ideas that we don't even have right now, uh, where how can we think from a QA point of view, to take an ex, an ex, a full chunk across 10 of the studios that they have, or 20 of the, the studios that we have. You'll hear an example with Microsoft, where we're co-developing a platform in localization together that we can then use across other publishers afterwards. And some are even asking us to think about m in a different way, to be able to serve them on the back of that. And I think this is a great time to do that. It's a great time because we've earned that trust over the year. I think we have a quality offering. We have a certain platform. And more importantly, because it taps into the natural entrepreneurship of our guys within the studios. And ultimately, it's what clients are expecting from us. So to bring that to life, I'll bring two customers. One of them is, uh, doesn't need much introduction. Uh, I'll come back to, to John right away. Um, and then uh, another one afterwards that I'm very proud to have with us that I, I would want to make sure that you get to really know them, because I think they're up to something very, very special. But the first one, we'll start with John Doyle, um, the creators of League of Legends franchise, incredible since 2009. 
Uh, they have clearly grown a lot since then. You'll hear some of the titles we've been working on, uh, including as well Arcade uh, as an hybrid model between films and, and games that is quite special. So uh, Mike and myself, uh, Mike was actually in, in LA with uh, John last week. Uh, we worked very closely with him for, for years and just asked him a few questions about our relationship right now and how he sees that evolving. I think there, there are a lot of complexities and challenges with bringing games uh, into the market. Uh, for Riot in particular, it's, it's somewhat extra challenging in that we uh, serve a global audience and going to market for a Riot game is just the beginning of a long journey. We expect these games to last for decades. Uh, and so that means that once a game is out, we need to continue to deliver great value to players. We need to continue to evolve the experience. And that means our teams and our needs are constantly growing. I think one of the things that Keywords brings us when we're trying to solve that for that global audience and for that uh, that long-term approach we have is that Keywords is also global. Uh, and Keywords provides a broad array of uh, capabilities. Uh, and so when we're dealing with global problems and uh, issues with rapidly changing scale and complexity, Keywords has been a great partner to help us navigate that space. I think Keywords and Riot have a somewhat unique relationship in that Keywords' ability to scale and provide uh, varied capabilities has helped Riot a lot. I think one great example is in localization, where we've had great success working with your Montreal and Dublin offices, and the MemoQ technology has been something that is kind of a vertical integration for, for us in terms of tools and localization. Uh, it's something that we've relied on and something that has paid big dividends for us within Riot. During the pandemic, we, we were launching four games in 2020 and 2021, Keywords was a great partner for us in working through the technical, IT, and security challenges that came uh, along with everyone shifting to work from home. And we were able to go forward and launch those games really without missing a beat. I think our ability to trust uh, Keywords and to be able to rely on, on the capabilities of the company have been a big part of our ability to succeed as we've scaled. Riot, in the last couple of years, has gone from being a single game company, although with one large game to now being a multi-game company with, with five services running, all of which are at significant scale. I expect like Arcane, which is that crossover from game to TV, uh, is a trend that is, is going to continue in the industry. So we at Riot believe that, that the core of entertainment in this century is going to come from games out to other mediums. Our ambitions are even bigger than the company is now, and uh, we are definitely looking for partners that can help us scale beyond our ability to just higher internally. Uh, Keywords is one of those companies uh, that we've worked with closely so far, and we think there's a future in working together more closely, uh, and we're really interested in sitting down and figuring out what that might look like. So hopefully that gives you a sense, and for example, with uh, Riot, we have uh, an ABI, an annual business review coming up uh, this summer, where we're sitting down with John and with his management team to really open up the portfolio and look at uh, whether it's Val, whether it's League of Legends, whether it's new titles coming up, uh, at how can we organize more solutions around that. So on that note, uh, I'll play another video while asking to uh, James to uh, join us on stage for Shark, from Shark Mob. But uh, let's Frederic do the talking to introduce you, James, if it's okay. Hello everyone, I'm Frederick. I'm CEO and co-founder of SharkMob, a game development company out of Sweden. I just wanted to take some of your time to tell you about our history. So we were founded about five years ago and we're already 350 people. We work out of two studios, one in London, one here in Malmö, Sweden. And we recently released our first game called Blood Hunt. And that was something that we celebrated together with some of the keywords companies that we work with. So we have a great collaboration, not just with, you know, more traditional art outsourcing, but also co-development of the game and marketing assets like video trailers and such. It wouldn't really have been possible for us to make this journey without a partner like Keywords. So we really appreciate all the help and all the support that we got from you guys over the years. Looking into the future of what we have in our pipeline, we have uh, a couple of new games that we already started to work on. Even though we're uh, fully acquired and part of the Tencent group, we still 
need to have that uh, collaboration with Keywords moving forward. So we have plans to work together over the next couple of years on those different projects. I do hope we meet soon again in real life. And um, Baton, it was a real pleasure to meet you in San Francisco. I do hope we meet perhaps at Gamescom. Uh, and uh, James, my uh, colleague and managing director of the London studio, he's there with you today to give you more information or answer any questions that you might have on, on Shark Mob. So good luck, guys, and hope to see you soon. James, that's the best of intro, I guess, from Frédéric. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so maybe a good place to say, first of all, thank you for, for spending time as well with, oh, with us today. Pleasure. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, we got the chance to visit the new studio that James is setting up in there. We were the first visitor, I think. You, you were indeed. We moved into our new office that you saw just up on that screen in Covent Garden last Monday. Um, so yeah, the, uh, Bertrand and the team were the first people to come and, come and welcome us to the new space. It's a pretty impressive space. It's 50 people right now, plus the Tencent team coming in as well. And yeah, yeah, 50, 55 of us right now, um, 20, 30 Tencent people and room for about 300. So we've got a lot of growing to do over the next few years. So those are the ones to watch, by the way. Just, I'm just <laughs> saying for, but part of the, the Tencent family as well, more broadly. James, do you want to share a bit more maybe about, uh, uh, congrats for Blood Hunt as well. Uh, Thank you. Amazing start. A bit more about uh, Shark Mob overall, maybe putting yeah, one spin into it and maybe the nature of our relationship over the, the past. Yeah, of course. So um, Shark Mob as a, as a company was really set up to um, be a next generation developer of very, very high production value video games. Um, most of the team in Malmo originally came from Massive Entertainment, known for The Division, part of Ubisoft. And um, when we started the team in London, it was very similar things. We wanted to make very large, very ambitious, very high production value uh, games, which is what we'd spent most of our previous careers uh, doing. Um, as, as Frederick mentioned, Shark Mob's actually a very young company. It's five years old, released its first game, uh, Blood Hunt, not too long ago. We are just over 18 months old as a London company, growing reasonably quickly. Um, but the partnership with Keywords has been hugely important to us for many reasons. But I think two big ones, um, I think you mentioned earlier, Bertrand, that the AAA games these days take four or 500 people. Yep. I've seen teams scale into the thousands now. Um, and alongside that, we're, we're growing a new team from, from the ground up. Um, we never wanted to be a company that was 500 people big in a single studio. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we, and we didn't want to scale so quickly that we couldn't keep tight control over or, or careful control over the way we develop our culture. And we, we want to onboard people properly. We want to scale in, in a sensible way. So in terms of both scale of our outfits and um, the ability to scale quickly for the games we want to produce. As, mm -hmm. as Frederick mentioned, we've got three games uh, now in, in some stage of development. Um, we needed to partner up with, with people, and Keywords has been the perfect partner for that for, for many reasons that I'm sure we'll dig into. I want to stay on Blood Hunt first for a second. Of course. Like we have a relationship with D3T. We have the founder of D3T in the room as well, uh, with Fire Without Smoke. You, in your previous life, you worked as well with Gobo, with yeah. Daksha. You want to show a bit more and maybe give us a hint of how Blood Hunt is doing as well? Yeah, so, so Blood Hunt, uh, say it's, it's, it's a very new game. It's been out for a matter of weeks. Um, is proving to be quite successful, more successful than we predicted, which is always, always good. Um, and I'd say uh, Keywords has really been an extension of our internal development team on almost every front. You mentioned a few of them there, but... Um, I, I've pro I, I probably can't count the number of individual key st keyword studios around the world that have been involved in, in creating Blood Hunt across, I think, pretty much every service line, if not all of the service lines. Um, and that's something that we expect to continue doing uh, for our future projects. We're already in conversations about the next few years and, and what that might look like. Um, I think I've been in games for over a decade now and, and working in a code of partnerships has always been part of the way we work, but it has drastically become a bigger part of the way we work. And uh, Keywords is making it much easier to do that kind of work than it, than, than it previously has been for certain. That, that's a nice thing to what the, the ambition that is ahead of us as well. Now you have another, we're talking about the 2026 yeah. time frame, Frederick was talking about it next couple of years. In truth, it's really next four you have two big titles, maybe as a hint, uh, James is a big fan of vampires. So it probably gives you a sense of the type of games, if I may, that I come Yeah, from. yeah. But uh, how do you see that evolving now? Because the, the complexity you're talking about is going to be exponentially bigger probably over the next few years it, together. It is indeed. I'd say Blood Hunt, while, it, while it's been a success for us, is, is 
it's quite a small project compared to what we've got coming up, what we've got coming down the pipeline. Uh, we have two more games in development, one being led out of Malmo, one being led out of London. Um, they are going to be, they're going to be big projects. And I say that yep. even with relative to the big projects that are, that are already out there. Um, and we are, as a new studio, as a new company in London, we're looking at our hiring plan, our growth plans for the next five to 10 years. We've had to do that when we're looking at new <coughs> office space. Say we've just moved into a space 40,000 square foot. So we had to put a lot of thought into how is our team going to develop. And so it's been important to us over the last uh, kind of 12 months in particular uh, in London, but also in Malmo to think about what's our team structure yep. look like? Who do we hire internally? Who do we partner up with? How do we partner up? What's the scale of those, those arrangements? And um, I know we've been having a lot of those conversations uh, yep. since, since we, we started our, our partnership together. There isn't really an, any other company that I can think of in the world that can offer that level of looking down the road across every service line and trying to work out how we best tailor a, a kind of partnership solution to delivering a project. And it's going to be a journey together, right? It One is, yeah. One of the things yeah. we've been talking about is like there are teething issues when you get to that type of scale. One of the things that one of the architects is in the room, but of those integrated solution architect or integrated yeah. solution producers, which is almost mirroring the producers here basically within SharkMob. Indeed, yeah. Have you found the discussion so far? Oh, it's, it's been hugely useful. I mean, I've, I think over my career, I've worked with two people in this room as, as, as key partners. Um, one, uh, Blandine over there, Paul here in, in, in the front. Um, and they've been incredibly valuable partners, not only to the companies I've worked with, but to me personally in terms of helping us solve development problems along the way. Um, one kind of very recent story, um, something that I, I don't think would have been possible in, in the world of games three or four years ago, probably not uh, kind of more than a year or two ago. Uh, we had a request uh, come across our door uh, just a few months ago. Um, we've got a milestone uh, for one of our early projects that's in concept, many PowerPoint presentations and trailers at, at this stage. Um, we have a milestone next Tuesday, uh, and we had a request put across our door just before GDC, so we're talking mid-March, that there's a new requirement that when we go through our gate, it would be nice to have a game trailer, one or two minutes of footage in the engine that we're building in that looks like the game we're looking to release in four or five years, that shows what the game will play like in four or five years without actually making the game. So this problem came up. Uh, we just happened to have lunch with Paul on the same day. So me and our art director, Ben, were complaining about this a little bit and trying to work out how we solve this problem. And uh, Paul took it upon his shoulders to try and find a solution within keywords. I think came back two days later, a day later, uh, with a uh, trailer farm to lead the way in terms of crafting the trailer. Yep. Um, but environment art support, character support, um, we're looking at localization support. And I say this happened within a couple of days. Um, I didn't think that was going to be possible. Uh, we'd have at least had to have gone around four or five different studios, spun up four or five different teams, um, managed four or five different teams, four or five different contracts. And in reality, I don't think it would have happened. Um, and I'm quite happy to say that we've got this milestone next week and uh, we've got a pretty special asset that we're going to share then. So thank you. Thank you to Paul and Keywords for making that happen. That's why he sits on the first seat. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't aware. And I can just look, him and, uh, look at him while we have that conversation. Okay, I have another one for you as well, Jens, which is about your part of Tencent as well as yes. family overall. Some investors might be wondering, what does it mean for the relationship? Frederick was hinting to it as well. Yeah. Can you share a bit more, especially Indeed. as you're very close to them now? Indeed, yeah. And it's interesting seeing Riot up, up on the screen as well, yeah. who are another, yeah. another part of the Tencent uh, family. So um, there are a lot of game studios now who are part of the Tencent family. Um, Tencent, to their credit, is... is, is very supportive, but relatively hands-off in the way we operate and the way we create our, our games. Um, however, they've done a really good job of connecting the various studios and companies that work within the organization. So we do talk with Riot, we do talk with Funcom. Uh, Tencent has started running um, both UK-based, but also global conferences with their various game studios. So we do share uh, learnings, we do pass on tips, we do talk about our successes and failures. Um, and different keyword studios is definitely a, a big talking point within the Tencent family. You see, Riot are obviously very pleased with the work that, that they've been doing with keywords. We're in a very similar place, and we will continue to share that within, within the Tencent family. And like keywords, I expect the Tencent family is going to continue 
growing over the next it's few years. part of the investment in strategic partnership as well. And maybe one last one. We could be here all day, actually. Yeah, indeed. But <laughs> I'm enjoying it. Uh, I can't. Okay. Uh, I'm seeing the time up there. But just one last one. If you were in the shoes of the investor and analyst community as well, it's like, how would you think about us? How would you think about keywords in that type of setup? Yeah, so I, I allude to this in, in kind of an earlier answer, but I, I, re I genuinely believe that keywords is, is unique in this idea that um, as a game developer, I can come to you with almost any creative staffing specialism problem and you are likely to have somebody within your portfolio that can solve that problem. Or more importantly, you can pull together two, three, four, okay. 10 different teams who can help solve that problem. Um, prior to keywords being where it is today, um, that would have been a huge amount of work to find all of the individual areas of support. As, as I was mentioning earlier, getting those teams contracted, managed, getting the process into a place where it works effectively, getting the relationship to a place where the, the teams can collaborate well is a huge amount of effort and it, it takes a lot of time. Um, this year, last year, keywords, I say, is uniquely in a place where we can come to you and solve those problems very quickly, very effectively. Um, and I don't, see, I don't see any other company in this space that is anywhere close to being able to deliver that level of service um, so that, that, that's to me the, the unique nature of keywords that makes it a very special company. James, thank you very, very much. Uh, thanks for spending the afternoon oh, thank with you. us. I know how busy you are, but uh, James will be available. We'll have a break after the tech section and then there are a few cocktails on which it was very interesting. Looking forward to meeting some of you there. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. And thanks for the partnership as well. Yes, thank you. So I'll just uh, close this section just with one thing that James was alluding to as well, uh, we also need to make a few adjustments and a few investments to make sure that we can take on that type of level of complexity and demand. And two of those are here on the map. You see Blondin, but we are going to invest more into client partnerships. So really being the trusted advisor uh, uh, across, across those partnerships, but also being able to know all the service lines and the type of solutions that we have inside out on that. I think Blondin, I don't know where you are, uh, but just wanted to Point to Blondine as well. Talk to her. Um, but Blondine is, is exceptional and knows that inside out, and we're going to make more investment there. Another one is the one we were just talking about, which is those integrated solution producers and architects. Uh, I'm pointing to Trina Marshall, who is really who joined at the same time as I did, and was had a massive impact within the firm uh, right away, and pushed us a bit with some discomfort, to be honest, to set up three, four of those roles, partly with, with some frictions in terms of being able to scale to the next level, and has had some, I would say, tremendous success so far. We're still early. We have probably four or five of those. Those are a rare breed of individuals. So if you know some great talent, we'll take them very happily because it needs the right EQ, the right IQ. It needs to be truly at the service of our clients. It needs to understand and handle the complexity and being able to package those type of solutions very, very quickly. But I would expect to see us investing much more across the top 25 relationship uh, in those type of areas. So, in conclusion, for, for that section on the strategic partnership, I think there is a, a, a clear appetite, as you can probably sense. Uh, you've, you've heard it from a couple of stories, but I think that's appetite, I'm hearing it from everywhere across the top publishers. Uh, I think the timing is really right, uh, because we couldn't have dreamt of that if we didn't have, and James was alluding to it, if you didn't have the full end propositions to be able to take that on. And it will require some investment, moderate investment, but to make sure that we can effectively uh, tap into that. So on that note, I'll tee off the second one around, uh, obviously, a topic very close to my heart, probably if you know my background on technology. Um, and then we'll take a break after these sections before moving on to the other ones. So in terms of technology, I'll uh, touch on two of the three recommendations that the, the team came up with. The first one is I'll open our own internal kitchen. I'll give you a bit of a sense of the good, the bad, the ugly, of where we have more to fix to be able to really go and, and scale to the next level. And secondly, I'll pass on to a team who has been driving a project, as I mentioned, with uh, Microsoft to drive more automation across localization, but the goal being to do that across all of our service lines. So let me take this one on uh, before passing on the baton. Uh, but this is a very open sharing of where we sit. When we looked at our own kitchen, the own architecture that we have, and I have to say, it was a lot of good works happening from our IT teams but fairly complex. We had about 14 different projects that were ongoing, many at different levels of scalability. And the major miss probably to me was great IT team, but it was not necessarily being picked up by our business teams. 
And so you had a mismatch where the tech team was trying to figure out what to do, what kind of architecture to do. And then uh, we got to realize, gosh, for an 11,000 people team, we have some gaps here. We, for example, how can we really operate at scale? Uh, and uh, we make it work because we have the right basis, but how can we operate at scale without having the right workforce management system, where we know at any point in time what has been allocated, what has not been allocated, so that when we're on the road, you know what we can promise, what we cannot promise, short term and long term. We want this to be, we want to have the right digital asset management in place so that each of our assets have the right depository with the right metadata behind so that we can also do reuse where it makes sense. We want this to talk to a Salesforce engine so that, which we have deployed, but how do we make sure that the connections are really strong? Once you have this, how does it talk to a forecasting system in NetSuite or in Targeting to make sure that we can have the right plans in place and the right visibility at any point in time? And you can sense, I'm a bit tough on ourselves, but there are some where we are very well advanced on the finance side. Uh, John's team has driven actually uh, something substantially, which are really simplifying our life, and even night and day compared to even five, six months ago. Uh, but there are some areas where we have some work to do. So I would expect us to see some investment on that to make sure we have the basics in place. It doesn't mean the full 14. We went back to really the basic of what needs to be in place to operate and to really get that collaboration going. Beyond that, I wanted to talk about automation. And that's where I'll pass on to uh, Mina and to Tony, who are here also on the front line. Uh, Mina has joined uh, at the same time we joined together, right? We're in the same cohort. Uh, and Mina runs a localization business, which is a 100 million PL across the globe. And I have to say, Mina, you'll see, has a very strong tech band that she's already put to use very, very strongly. Tony came to the family two years ago with the acquisition of Kentan AI. And if I'm really candid, Tony, it's like this has been an incredible acquisition, but it was subscale in the way we're using it across the broader set of the network. So Mina and Tony found each other, said, and they looked at a very specific client at, at Microsoft, one of our, one of our top-tier clients, uh, where on localization, we had, there is a particular deal that we had not won since 2017, while being pitching for it a couple of times. And part of it was also because we couldn't even fulfill the level of demand that it required for my linguist as part of that. So I'll let them tell the story of how they, they found the solution for that problem. Thank you very much, Bertrand. And hello, everybody. My name is Romina Franceschina, um, and I'm Service Line Director for Localization Services. Now, just in case, um, for those of you that may not be uh, familiar with our discipline, Localization Services is the art of taking an asset, in our case, uh, video games, and um, translating that content into multiple languages, making the cultural as well as genre-specific adaptations that are required for the product to then be fit for the market. Now, at the beginning of this year, we were um, approached by Microsoft, who were looking for a partner that would help them make their localization processes smarter. Um, they are a very mature buyer of localization services. I'm sure you understand that they've been localizing their products for quite a long time. And when they approached us, they had a really specific uh, list of requirements. They wanted a system that would allow them to process a lot of content fast, but equally important for them, it was the fact that they wanted the system to be simple and easy to deploy. Interestingly enough, one of the key things for them was they did not want to invest their own uh, resources to developing this. So for them, it was important to find a partner that would already um, bring in all the expertise in localization services and they would take um, their priority list and run with it and develop the solution together with them. At that point, Tony and I knew that we were perfectly placed to fulfill that brief because we had two key um, elements within the keyword solution. We had best-in-class technology, but equally importantly, we, had a very, we have a very extensive team of uh, workflow experts that can bring all of that uh, requirement together. Um, so why would a traditional workflow not be um, suitable for a Microsoft solution? There is a very simple answer to that, scalability. When you think about the volumes of content, we know that it's impossible, it's very difficult to bring in enough um, human resources and also um, linear uh, type of workflows tend to use multiple technologies in the solution, so it gets really difficult to scale. So what we did for Microsoft is we took their list of priorities and we brought together key people within our organization. We brought together our developers, 
our workflow experts, as well as our talent managers. We took the model and we simplified it, we stripped it apart. We worked on three main categories. The first thing uh, that was very important was to make sure that end-to-end -end there will be a single technology driving the workflow through. This brought in the simplicity and the um, access to data that Microsoft were very interested in. The second aspect that was very important um, to uh, take into account was automation. When you are talking about volumes, you need to make sure that you're automating as many of those low-value uh, tasks as you can. Again, um, we eliminated waste, and equally importantly, we reduce risk. And the third element for us that was um, really important was to make sure that we could safeguard all of those high-value tasks that are better serviced by human experts, so the experts in the loop, people that would make sure that quality is built into the process of localization. Now, it may sound counterintuitive um, to work on automation like this. The interesting thing is, working on this type of solution opens up new avenues of revenue for keywords, because the reality is our clients have a lot more content to produce, and it would not be physically possible and financially possible for them to treat those volumes um, with the traditional workflows. So we know that the investment in this solution is absolutely critical for us and for our clients. Now, we're really proud of the solution that we build, so Tony will give you a quick sneak peek of what it is that we're doing for Microsoft. OK, thank you very much, uh, Romina, for that introduction. Hi, everybody. My name's uh, Tony O'Dowd, and I'm Head of Research at uh, the uh, Keywords uh, Localization Research Labs. And my job is to embed AI into the localization process. And really, the sub-objective uh, of that is to make AI the norm for keywords rather than the exception. So we've got quite a broad stroke of ideas of, and objectives and so on uh, that we have to achieve. Now, the high volume translation service for Microsoft brought together two key technologies that we had developed as part of Cantana AI. One was a neural machine translation system, and the second one was a very flexible workflow system called Cantan Stream. And by bringing those technologies together, we were able to reduce the time to process files from Microsoft from hours, in sometimes days, down to minutes and seconds. Okay, so the first job hit the project um, Cantan Stream three weeks ago, and within eight minutes, the job was picked up by one of our experts in the loop, our translators, and was delivered back to Microsoft 24 minutes later. Okay? Now, that doesn't sound like a too big a challenge to do in one for one file, but of course, remember, we've thousands of these files coming in, in up to 30 uh, different languages. And in fact, this particular project from Microsoft covers 15 game titles that we had previously never worked on in 31 languages, and they want every single file that they send to us returned back in less than 48 hours. And at the moment, after three weeks running the system for them live, we're now returning 97% of the files back in uh, less than 48 hours. Unbelievable level of automation. Um, one of the things that we've got that makes this possible is that we actually embed our systems directly into the content management systems that are used by Microsoft. So we go way upstream directly into our client. Now, this positions us into a tremendous powerful position that we're now part of their development pipeline. And what we do is we extract that content at lightning speed, 24 by 7, 365 days of the year, and we deliver it downstream to the translators that need to get the work done very, very quickly. And it's the time difference between the extraction of content and the delivery to the translator makes all the difference in the world. And this is where this system is so unique. So what we've got here is we have a new system that brings speed, scalability, and simplicity to a rather complex uh, workflow of game localization. The translators are actually part of a community. So everybody has heard of these new ways of working. Uber is a community of drivers. What we've actually done in Keywords is we've now built a community of both professional editors and professional reviewers. And we actually manage that community on our platform. So we curate them, we vet them, and we onboard them automatically. And as soon as a job comes in from Microsoft, 
that community is notified automatically that there's a job available. So we can now work seven days a week, something we couldn't do before. We can now work in any time zone in the world so we can follow the sun. We can actually implement an FTS uh, strategy. And the great thing about this is our community of translators can work any time, any place, on any device, because this system that you're looking at here works on every single platform. It's not restricted to Windows platforms. It works on Macintosh platforms. They can even actually work, believe it or not, on their mobile phones. Okay, so now we have this great capability to reach out and distribute these jobs. Another part of our solution as well is that we're using extensive AI to make this a reality. So what are we doing in terms of using AI? Well, the first thing we can do is not only can we pre-translate content now for our clients, we can actually determine the quality of that content. How good is that machine translation? How good is that translation memory? If it's a very high quality, using our AI systems, what we can do is we can send it to the reviewer rather than send it to a post editor and then the reviewer. So we're taking out one step in the process. And that one step in the process, believe it or not, represents about 50% of the cost of the entire process. So by using AI, we have the ability to squeeze more efficiencies out of the process, and the actual financial efficiencies are quite significant. The other thing that we can do as well is, one of the briefs that Microsoft gave us was that they wanted total transparency in the way we're running the system. They wanted to see who was working on the files, when they're working on the files, and how good they are working on the actual file content. And we gave them a dashboard just similar to this here, where they can actually see who's actually translating right down to the individual string within a game. Okay? Now, why are we building that type of data? Well, believe it or not, the next generation AI systems that we've got to build needs that level of data modeling, so we can actually start building recommendation models next year and we can actually pick the best translator for the content that's coming in for our clients. So we're already thinking a year ahead that we have to build the data models today in order to stay ahead of the market um, in a year's time. And the final thing about our system as well is that we couldn't do this without these experts, these editors and reviewers. And what we've actually done for them is we've built an entire new translation surface for game localization. So when they actually load up a game and start working on it, they see not only pre-translations of every segment in the string, they also get all the glossary hits, and they also get various other information that makes it super efficient to actually work in our environment. Now, the great thing about this solution, guys, is it's sticky for our clients. Once our clients deploy this, it's incredibly difficult for our competitors to come in and take that business away because they don't have systems that we're developing here today. We're unique in that sense. So Canton Stream, we were lucky in the sense that we already had a workflow system. But in order to get Canton Stream ready for Microsoft, we had to do extensive extensions to it. Now, because we already had a workflow system that's very modular, it's cloud-based, we have about, at the moment, 300 servers running this platform, believe it or not. So it just gives you a sense of how extensive this platform is. Microsoft gave us six weeks to embed it in their development cycle and go live. And the actual day that we went live was Wednesday three weeks ago, and so far we've processed about 1,000 jobs on the platform. Quite an incredible um, achievement, considering that we had no uh, live test of the actual solution. We had to go straight into production in a live capacity. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. And really quick note um, about Canton. Um, as Tony said, we went live uh, on the 18th of um, last month. And I'm like you, uh, John, I keep track of how many projects we've done for them. You keep uh, lose track of employees, I keep lose uh, track of projects. Um, and the funny thing, or the best part of this, is the fact that the initial feedback from Microsoft has been absolutely fabulous. So we spent around five minutes celebrating the launch, and then we moved right back into development mode, and we're working on the next set of priorities for Microsoft. Now, Again, you know, the beauty of Kantan is um, they were brought into the keywords family because they have an 
incredibly uh, unique approach to machine translation. But what we're doing with the technology today is we're stretching it to deliver efficiencies. And um, those efficiencies are absolutely indispensable for us to be able to partner with our clients and deliver the work that they need. So thank you very much. And Bertrand, over to you. Thank you, Mina. Thank, thank you, Tony. Thank you, both of you. I, I think this was only just an idea in January, I think it's fair to say, and based on the technology you've been developing for years. So uh, really impressive. I, I love the fact that it's live and, and the feedback that is coming away. I think the thing that strikes me uh, on, on that example is also that uh, when you think about it, it's a SaaS. It's really a translator as a service to some extent. Tony made the point very eloquently, which is embedded into the workflows. That's something very sticky, as we were talking about uh, that earlier today. Uh, our job now is not to stop there. Our job is across each of the service line, and actually that's the job of each of our service line leaders, is how do we drive that? How do we have that mindset everywhere? How do we automate uh, systematically? And it's starting to be in motion already. We have, you'll hear from Mathieu Lachance a bit later today uh, in, uh, from, from, uh, uh, from Canada. He's starting to think, leading our testing uh, capabilities. He's starting to think very differently, and we have an acquisition that is in the go that may help us accelerate that. You'll hear as well, I mean, if you were to hear about our player support piece, we already have a partnership with a company called HelpShift, where we are starting to go, go to market in a true uh, symbiotic way as well together. So the job is really how do we do exactly what you just heard, but how do we do the 10x over the next three years across each of the service lines? So in short, I think to, to take this away, uh, we have uh, uh, prioritized the work that we want to do in our own internal kitchen, internal capabilities, so that we can really not only dream about platforms, but really make it happen at, at all levels, at all touch points, without adding any complexity to the entrepreneurs on the country to remove many of the red tapes away. Uh, 10x automation, how do we do that everywhere? It's, it's our day job, it's part of the job description if you're a business leader uh, within keywords. Innovation, I'll touch on it later today. I'll just introduce uh, Jamie Campbell, who is here in the room. Jamie uh, used to run up to very recently, he's passing on the baton a game development practice. He was the founder of D3T, uh, one of our most successful studio in game development, running a 1500, building a 1,500 people team, and I has decided to go and run innovation for us across each of the service lines. So I'll share a little bit more about where it comes organizationally in that, but very grateful for Jamie to take that on, but that will be a, a quarterback to be able to make all this effectively happen. And maybe one last point I want to close on on this section is this doesn't happen if you think one year. So somehow we need to take the, the, the thinking as well about how do we think two, three years while creating the right urgency and the type of mobilization that I think Tony and Mina have demonstrated today. So on that note, we'll take a break uh, before getting to the next work streams. Uh, if you want to reach out to Tony and Mina, they are happy to give you a demo as well of, of the platform very openly as well. And we'll see each other in, at 3.30. Okay? In 10 good minutes. So thank you. See you shortly. Okay, so we'll keep our whistle tour to go through the, the work stream. Number three is about uh, one keyword. So you've heard me talk about one keywords a lot, um, and I'll share a few more thoughts about that. But frankly, I hope you get to see what one keywords really mean through the examples you saw there. Even look at Mina and Tony coming together, the way they came together with a client and shaped that with quite a few of our studios as well, helping behind quite a few of our teams. That to me is really one keywords. Uh, when you look at the, those work streams and the way they came together, the 50, 60 leaders mobilized, with many of their teams uh, playing a role into that, to me, that was really one key word into action. That's the type of culture that we want to keep shaping. Uh, we've had some interesting and, and uh, difficult challenges as well, discussions that we've had that we didn't shy away from. Typically, every organization, whatever business you need to have, you have a point of view about how sales should be organized, should it be globally, should it be local. We have had those discussions. We are reshaping incentives. We are making sure that we can operate more as one keywords as well together as part of those streams. That's also one keywords to me. But what I wanted to do in, in this next section is to go a bit more specific and share um, uh, specifically the organization that we've been evolving, John and myself, uh, over the past few months. And we announced it on May the 3rd uh, after a lot of work with those 50 leaders. Uh, and I'll share very transparently what we have uh, come up to. Uh, maybe a few guiding principles. Uh, first of all, you'll see I wanted to simplify, uh, to take that moment to simplify the nature of the service lines we have. Many of you are familiar with our service lines. We have about eight to ten, depending on how you count. Uh, clients are getting confused at some places because of the, var the variability that we have across those. So we thought that as we keep growing and keep expanding our services, 
this was a, a good moment to bring that together. We also wanted to amplify the, the voice of the studio. Uh, when I joined the first summit before joining officially in October, and it was the top 30 leaders across keywords being there for, for three days. And one thing that stuck with me was that there was actually no studio heads present at all. Yes, we had the service line heads being there, but we had no studio. This cannot be right in an organization where ultimately we are really operated through the entrepreneurship of our studio. So you'll hear us talk about the, the construct we've put in place called the hubs. Clearly, I couldn't get 70 leaders to join the leadership team on top of the 30, but I think we've found an elegant solution to do that via some of the larger studios representing others as well. Key to us was also to retain the entrepreneurship. I think that's what makes us magic. Uh, I know it sounds a bit high level, but if you have been following keywords over the years, and part of the advice from Andrew Day was the entrepreneurship we have is really what makes us very special. Uh, I consider myself as an entrepreneur as well, and I think that's something we absolutely wanted to keep on, making sure as well when we look at the span of controls that we don't add complexity to that and we don't add professional managers. And finally, uh, we wanted it to, to reflect the five work streams. So I was talking about the service lines, and something that might be uh, of interest to all of you is you can sense we're going to start talking now about create, globalize, and engage. Create is effectively bringing art and game development together. You'll hear about a, a new leader for that area uh, very shortly, uh, but I think this is a composition of about 25 studios, and it makes eminent sense when you look at it. From a client point of view, uh, more importantly than anything else, uh, and also internally, when you look at many of our game dev studio, 30, 40, 50 percent of the capacity is really around art. So this will enable us to, to collaborate much more and I think to deploy a mus muscle much, much more. Globalize is a mix of many of the uh, post-production services that we have, have there. You've heard about localization, uh, but also functional testing. Those are pretty big teams where it's less about the essence of the studios themselves, but how do we really build it up for scale uh, in their fit quite nicely. We have an asterisk there. We've put m and &E for reporting purposes in there, but in truth, uh, we have a, a very strong leader. We'll share a bit more about m and &E later today via John. And thirdly, one that is, so the first two are roughly 200 million uh, P&Ls. The third one is roughly uh, 100 by putting marketing services and player support together. And I th I'm quite excited by that one. You'll hear from Tony a little bit later today. This is the potential to me to be a mini keywords in its own right. And you might think about player support as being more a post-production piece with high volumes, but truly, it's where the insight about the customers really come in. That's where we get a lot of the insights that can help develop the open world, de develop the games if we capture that very early. I think it fits very nicely with the marketing propositions we've been building over the past few years. So in terms of org itself, I think hopefully not a major surprise, but I wanted to take that time to really reshape the organization in a way that can build for, for what we've been describing. On the left-hand side, you see Mike Wallen, uh, Chief Commercial Officer, who is in the room. Mike? Is there. Uh, and Mike's job is really to find ways to create incremental revenue, but also to help shape some of those strategic partnerships that we've been talking about. So it's a, a, a twist into the nature of the job, but I really to want, wanted to make sure that the voice of the customer was at, at, the, at the top table as well. Then I'll come back in more details on the COO, C Chief Studio Officer uh, role. Uh, John has very kindly agreed to step in at interim on top of what he does day to day as well. We have reinforced his team on the CFO side, uh, especially on the financial side. And openly, we have opened a job search effectively for, for that role. Uh, John is on point. I'm fairly close as well to that area. It has the advantage as well for me to get to really know the business inside out. That's where a lot of the action really happens, to get close to the 10,000, 11,000 that we have. But that's where the PNL really is. Uh, so I think we're jointly fronting that uh, right now. I'll come back on that right away. Then a new role that we have stepped up recently, led by Nicolas Lioroux, is our shared services. So fairly common in many organizations, but I would say Nicolas is one of the toughest jobs in the organization. His job is really to build a machine, to make sure that we're serving the studio, and really when I talk about 10x, to make sure that we can make that happen. The way I describe this job spec is, Nicolas, you're in charge of effectively serving the studios, so your customers are really the studios, to avoid any confusion, but at the same time with a few non-negotiables. So in terms of infosec, cybersecurity, type of data transfer, and, and some of the platforms that need to be in place. We then have uh, the CFO offices, including MA. You'll hear about Nuno, who was referred to a few times already, uh, but I think it's a very world-class team. Then, no surprise to you, the five work stream being represented through tech. We just talked about it. 
and uh, our chief culture officer, which is something new, but as part of shaping one keywords, I wanted to make sure that we put uh, even more muscle in that area uh, and we grouped a few functions together. So all I have left to do on this one is to uh, call on a few colleagues and we'll go back on the CEO, CSO. And I'll start with uh, Ashley Lou, who is probably somewhere on screen with us. Ashley is a leader for uh, Create, so again, a 200 million PNL. Uh, Ashley comes to us since 2016 as the founder of Mindwalk, uh, one of our key art studio. In 2018, she took over art overall. Uh, she even ran marketing uh, more recently. Uh, she's a, an incredible entrepreneur, and she's really an engineer at the core. So John and I ask her to step up and to take probably one of the biggest uh, functions we have, which is create game development and uh, art effectively together. So Ashley, I don't know if you're here, but Ashley is in Beijing, uh, Chinese, Canadian, uh, but working from home at the moment. Ashley, you want to take it over? Yes, I will. Thanks, Bechan. Um, I don't know how big I am on screen right now, but um, if I'm really big, I apologize for that. I, I, it's a, something I've been used to for the past three years. Um, it's a shame that I can't be there with you, but hopefully at the next CMD, I will be able to meet some of you in person. So I'm really excited to be able to take on this new role. As like Betran said, it really speaks to my STEM roots. Despite the fact that I did start an art studio some 20 years ago, my crowd has always been the engineers and the geeks. And it is really in this crowd that I'm the most comfortable. So now six years into keywords and over 20 years in the game industry, I've never seen as much potential for this industry and the company as I do now. As we all know, we're well into the next console cycle. Our clients are raising the quality bar to deliver bigger and better experiences to their players. They're also continuing to invest in their already released IPs, driving for that long tail of player engagement. Both of these factors are driving up demand. And as the largest service provider in this industry, Keywords is well positioned. So when we looked at how we organized ourselves for that growth, it was evident that we should combine arts and game development service lines for the following two reasons. First, as Bechon mentioned before, art has always been the most significant part of most game development projects, typically around 30 to 50%. When we were separate, we lost some of that possible synergies. Furthermore, our art clients are asking less for just art services. And over the past few years, the art service line has been pushed to take on more of what I call visual codev. Hence, it made a lot of sense to combine these two service lines. The merger would also allow the studios to feel more confident to take on bigger projects, um, knowing that they now have 20 sister studios behind them. The second reason is that there are many similarities on how we manage, recruit, and retain studio talents between these two service lines. You'd be surprised at how comparable our artists and engineers are. There's a lot of overlap in terms of processes, workflow, tools, skill sets between art and game development. These similarities meant we can implement structures that are applicable to both, thus gaining efficiency on scale. However, merging these two service lines left us with over 20 studios, now one more across four continents to manage. And, uh, and we know that number will grow fast. Hence, we needed to simplify the structure and we did it by organizing our studios regionally. We have created what we call hubs, seven hubs to be exact. And they're led by our regional directors. These regional directors promoted from their studio head roles will continue to manage their own studios. They will be the first in line to resolve issues outside of normal operations within their geographies. They're asked to find synergies and strategies to assist in the growth of studios in their regions. And they're asked to embody the servant leadership philosophy, one that is opposite of big bosses. The team will also assist in our M&A efforts. The structure lets the individual studios retain their autonomy and stay true to their entrepreneurial DNA but gives them the support when they need it. 
Hence, in this formation, we can take full advantage of the keywords platform, but keep our agility. So to capture the content demand tidal wave that's here and coming. And back to you, Bechon. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. And from, uh, thanks a lot for that. And I don't know what time it is over there, but uh, probably fairly late. But from Beijing, we'll go to Montreal, where we get Mathieu Lachance uh, joining us. Mathieu is uh, uh, joined us as part of Babel, for those who remember eight or nine years ago as part of the testing teams. Um, he has really built up his creds progressively, uh, owning more and more of the testing facilities overall. I think he, it's fair to say he has a lot of the scares on his body. Some of you got to see the facilities a couple of years ago uh, with uh, almost 2,500 people in Montreal alone, and then much bigger operations that have grown across uh, the world. He's a true entrepreneur, and uh, now he has taken over the role of globalized as a whole in very close partnership with Mina, who you saw earlier. So, Matt, I'll pass it on over to you. Thanks, Bertrand. Hello. As discussed by Bertrand, we're structuring post-production services together. This brings many advantages to our clients, to our organization, and to our employees. For client, this moves us, this move allows us to be more client-centric, as game testing, localization, and audio services are often bought together and managed together from the client side. It allows for better, easier, and centralized game project management and client communication. For keywords, it allows a better and streamlined process, especially for localization, as we can have leaders overseeing the whole localization process from translation to voice recording and testing. <coughs> this brings better quality and lower cost. It also makes it easier for us to apply and leverage standard technology across all of these services, which allows us to then automate more easily and freely our production. For employees, this structure allows for more growth and employment opportunities through easier cross-service trainings and promotions. For these four services, apart from our classic aggressive growth, we've had two focus over the last few years. One, right-shoring our business, and two, applying new technology. We intend to continue both of these efforts. Regarding right-shoring, three years ago, we were very Montreal, Dublin, and Milan-centric. Now. We have expanded and diversified our work base globally. We implemented a follow the sun model that allows us to work around the clock. We have more price point to offer clients. We can move uh, more easily work from one studio to another. We've reduced our average cost and we're more resilient than ever. Again, it's a win for our clients and a win for our company. Poland, India, and Manila are great success stories of this movement and we're exploring further location to repeat that story again. Our plan is to do so in current existing studios where we already have other services and can leverage existing infrastructures. This means a faster, easier, less expensive, and overall safer global expansion. Regarding technology, we're progressively applying automation and AI technology to our production. We're pushing more and more standardized integration of our tools across the world, which allows us to automate work more easily. In the recent years, we've also started leveraging the large amount of data that we have, but also that our clients have for machine learning and artificial intelligence in our business. What Romina and Tony showed you with Canton AI is one example of these AI capabilities we're expanding into. These efforts increase our employee satisfaction allow us to reduce internal costs and provide our clients with new and exciting services. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and then back from, uh, thanks a lot, thanks for that. Back from uh, Montreal to London, uh, we have, I'll just introduce Tony. We'll see uh, Tony a little bit later today. Um, Tony, uh, join us, Greg, you may raise your hand, Tony, so that people can find you afterwards, but. Tony joined us very recently um, from WPP, where he had been one of the most senior leaders over there for, for many, many years. I'm not allowed to say how many years, uh, but um, he was also the MD of Ogilvy uh, and part of the global uh, board of Ogilvy. And then more recently has been orchestrating partnership across the WPP entities on behalf of clients. So really fitting with the strategic partnership that we talked about earlier. And the last few years has been the CEO of uh, Global Partnership, 
uh, at Hogarth, which is effectively the uh, uh, produ production outsourcing facility from WPP in there. So you'll hear from Tony a bit later because he will come in and share a few first thoughts. I don't think it's totally fair, but he has no choice. Uh, he's a few weeks into the job, but a few uh, first thoughts in terms of M&A and how he sees effectively that service line uh, growing up. Uh, fair to say as well that Tony will work very closely with Fred Arans, uh, who is based in Tokyo, uh, who we don't have on screen right now, but there's a very close partnership here where Fred has been running place support and much more across the group. Many of those cross collaboration across service lines is really Fred. Um, and uh, John will mention a little bit later today uh, a fantastic leader that we have based in LA called LOD Powers running the m &E business as we touch on that later. And I already mentioned Trina who's really a quarterback on anything on the uh, solution architect uh, joining us uh, fairly recently. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a snapshot. Part of the intent is to simplify the service line. I think that will allow as well much more collaboration uh, between uh, the teams. Uh, a lot of it is really about that entrepreneurial DNA that we have across the group and how do we amplify that voice to the studio. Uh, finding the right mix between global and local. I think we found the right elegant solution. At least the organization feels at the right place right now, but we'll need to keep working on that. And then I touched on the role of the shirt services and the spine. Uh, and the best analogy for that is like, if you build a spine that is too rigid, the entire body uh, just doesn't move anymore. If you don't have a spine, it doesn't bring each of the units and the power of what we have really together. So that's it from, from one key words. On that note, I'll uh, introduce you to uh, our next MC for the next uh, session called uh, Joe, you want to come in? Yeah. Come over. <laughs> Joe Binion. Yeah. Joe, um, is, has been a partner in crime since I started. He was actually the architect of a lot of what you've seen across the five work stream. And I met him for the very first time at that summit that was organized in October. And I sort of coerced him in taking that role of chief uh, cultural officer starting effectively June the 1st, which includes HR, which is critically important for us, but also PMO, also the cultural agenda that we have more broadly, uh, and a few other tidbits. So he will guide you through the next uh, section. Over to you, Joe. Okay, so thank you, Bertrand, for that. I mean, I am really privileged to join uh, Keywords. Um, I started working with Keywords late last year, as Bertrand mentioned, in the first summit. And we went all the way through to the summit in terms of the chase, you know, shaping the five work streams that we've been talking about today. I'm really, really excited about joining this business at this point in time. It, it, is, an, it is a new evolution of the business rather than a transformation of the business. But the really critical thing, I think, is that what we will be looking to do is to really ignite the talent that we've already got in the business and then grow from there. It's a, it, it really is immense when you think about the talent in the business and the opportunities we've got ahead. So in the culture team, what we've done is we've put all of the elements and the cultural levers together. So all the people aspects, the talent acquisition, the talent development, uh, the, some of the strategic projects, uh, communication, engagement, uh, some of the responsible business agenda. Uh, so it's literally about bringing all those elements together. That's what will drive the cultural change. Now, as you probably were, like uh, any other business, we're going to face similar challenges. So uh, we know that we've got increasing competition for uh, you know, real talent. We know that we're facing inflationary pressures. We know that we've got movements in different locations which are difficult to handle. Uh, so we'll really need to work on our employee value proposition, but we will do that constantly. We'll continue turning, turning that over, continue looking at the, what options we've got. And in reality, we have to do that, because if we don't do that, we won't attract the type of talent that we want to attract, if you think about the people we're competing with. So we really need to you know, keep moving on this and keep moving fast. So when we talk about the talent and capabilities work stream, uh, one of our early priorities has been to look at the alignment of compensation and benefits with what we're trying to achieve as an organisation. So we are midst that work and we'll continue to make incremental changes through this year and into 2023 as we look at opportunities to really align the incentives across the organisation. The second thing, and, and John alluded to it earlier, we don't do a great job in some instances about communicating what we actually do do from a compensation and benefits perspective. So if you look at competitors, we don't really articulate as well as they do for people either in the organization or outside the organization. So we're doing quite a bit of work in specific locations where we need to do this, 
about how do we clear, communicate clearly our, our compensation and benefits and make adjustments where we need to. So I'm not really going to talk much about compensation. What I'm really going to talk about is the, uh, the really critical elements of acquiring and developing our talent. Now, the, the, these are, you know, into, as I go to say, going back to growth, that's the, that's the critical thing for us. So what I'm going to do, uh, instead of me talking all the time, is I'm going to take you on a very, very quick whirlwind tour around the world. So we're going to talk about some of the successes that we already have. So we're going to go to Canada uh, to talk about a very successful uh, game development studio growth. Uh, we're going to go to Poland uh, to talk about growth in post-production, as Matt was alluding to before. Uh, and we're going to talk, to, uh, basically we'll go to India and then come back to FC in the room here, I'll explain how that's going to work, um, uh, to talk about talent development and, and academies. So, first off, uh, we're going to go to Ottawa in Canada. So I'd like to introduce you to Jean-Sylvain Sormeny, uh, who leads our Snowden Studios. He's the head of the studio. He was uh, president and co-founder of Snowden. And Snowden joined Keywords four years ago. So uh, he's going to take us on the journey for the Snowden studio uh, and the growth uh, since acquisition. Hi, John Sylvain. Hi, Joe. Thank you. So uh, when we joined in uh, 2018, our, our motivations was, one of the motivations to join Keywords was to grow. We knew there would be challenge in the supports of Keywords through business supports. And what's now uh, one Keywords would be uh, key to the success. At the time of the acquisitions, we were 26. As of this week, I'm really proud to say that we've just passed the 180 employee marks. Since joining, we also had the opportunity to work on high profile titles, in part because of keywords. One of the titles you see on this slide, for example, Zone 5, was introduced through the Keywords Business uh, Group. Next slide, please. Our strategy to grow was multiple fold, uh, which are all required in order to succeed. First, it's great projects and a variety of works within them. Uh, when we are a keyword studio, there is a unique proposition for our staff to be working on a more larger uh, quantity of titles than uh, typical uh, stu studios in the industry. We also pro uh, provide opportunities for a variety of skill sets. Um, and we are proud to say that we have a great studio culture that puts employee first and includes a no-crunch no policy. It makes me very happy to say that our employee seems to love our company, our employee uh, net promoter scores, and our best places to work awards uh, that we, we, we got last year is our testimony of it. The support of our other group through business solutions and collaborations with other studios were also uh, at core of our growth success. More, rec more recently, we invested in talent acquisitions with a dedicated resource committed to our growth. Uh, this is linked to the Specialized Recruitment Keywords Initiative. Uh, we saw exciting and tremendous uh, results from this initiative, and we, this is now shared within Keywords. Uh, we have now also embedded presence with college and universities. And we are seeing a diversification of our operations by inviting other service lines to operate in our regions. A lot of those strategies that we've put in place are now replicated also within the groups uh, for all the, stu the studios. As you can see, since our acquisitions, we've been accelerating our growth and there was key moments that were triggered to our expansion phases. It is important to mention that our location is important. We do this in a region that gives us proximity to all America while being in a city where uh, we don't compete directly with customers for talents, even with the nearby Montreal and Toronto centers. We are now targeting uh, 550 employees by 2027, uh, and we are on track to reach that goal. Back to you, Joe. Oh, thanks, John Savan. And uh, you know, I think it's a really great, um, uh, you know, success story. Particularly, obviously, having joined the Keywords family and just uh, how that's gone uh, since that point. So, building on the story we've just heard from John Savan in the games development. Um, we can also demonstrate this type of growth in, in other service lines. So uh, we're going to talk about the post-production services, but uh, I'm really going to sort of take us off to a story in Poland. Now, unfortunately, you're going to have to imagine that we're going to Poland because I'm telling the story here, so you're, you're still going to be still staying in the same room, but we're not going to Poland. So I'll talk about post-production. 
Now, that team is a pre-COVID team, I think, and it's pretty small. Uh, where we are now, uh, from a Poland perspective, is that we just broke 1,000 people uh, in May this year. So this is a demonstration of just how we can scale uh, post-production services. And the team has actually gone from, it's actually lower than that, it was 40 before that time, uh, but it's gone to uh, well, over 1,000 in three and, a, three and a half years. So what happened in Poland is that they had FQA, uh, it started in Katowice, in uh, April 2019 was the first time that they really got the team together. But that team quickly and organically grew uh, with strong teams across the service lines. So FQA, LQA, play support. Uh, they've developed strong partnerships with publishers and the, the leading universities in the area. Uh, they've got a really positive EMPS, a bit like Jean Servan's team. They are uh, way up there in terms of scores. It's one of the highest. Uh, and the team there is focused on really supporting the global service line. So it's globalization and it's utilization of their team, <laughs> which means that they can support wherever the project is coming from, uh, which gives utilization, but also gives, importantly gives options to clients when they look at how they're going to resource projects. So whilst we've mentioned Katowice here, and uh, Matthew mentioned it as well, I think, um, that's not the only example. If you look at the growth story in the Philippines, which is huge, if you look at the story in, in Mexico, it is also very, very rapid. So it's how we're growing scale in these post-production service lines. So now we're going to give you an example of one of our, um, really our sort of talent development and growth initiatives, and one of the critical ones we're looking at as a result of what the work we've done this year. So initially we're going to head to India, and we're going to hear from... Uh, Manvendra Shukul, who not only is our uh, head of uh, the India operations, head of the studios there, but Manvendra is, uh, I have to say, is a leading light in India in the games industry. He's, a, he's a, you know, he, he advises the government, etc. Now, when, I, when we go to India, there are a number of things that we should be aware of. We already have a presence of 850 people in India. It is also a, a very, very large active participation in games. Uh, all of the global companies, or so many of the global companies, have presence there. So they are working in, in, that, uh, in that area. Um, I think most of us would understand that India has a quality servicing 24-7 mindset that supports so many other industries. So that mindset of service and quality is, is you know, well embedded in, in, in the mindset. Uh, and, you know, to me, as an outstanding footnote, uh, India has one million engineers coming out of university each year. So, scale-wise, that's just incredible. So, I'm just going to show a video from Mandra, who talks about um, how we're going to use the concept of our art academy in, in India that's been developed, and translate that to how we can use it in game development. Hello, we are talking about talent and we are talking about creation of talent. And what better place than India to do that? Today we have more than 850 people across art, localization and FQA. It wasn't the case maybe about 7-8 years back. So we, we were a small team but with great ambitions. So we, what we did was we started an academy called In-Game Academy for art, because that's where the big gap was. Looking at where we are today, I think we are very successful. We have created hundreds of artists. Now, looking at the needs of the global game dev studios of keywords, we are taking the learnings of the art studio and the art academy and migrating those learnings, framework, and the process that we have created to creating courses for creating game dev engineers. And India is one of the best places for engineers. We have a more than a million engineers passing out every year. The only thing that we need right now is to give them the direction that we need to make sure that they, are, they become relevant to the requirements of our global game studios. So we are working very closely with all the studios in US, Europe and Australia to make sure that we understand what the requirements are, we understand what the needs are, we understand what the benchmark of quality and understanding and skill sets are. 
within that that framework within that that uh, discussion that we are having we have arrived at a, a really good framework which is based on the learnings that we have had in the past 7 8 years of how are we going to create create and grow this uh, game dev and engineering talent we are all very excited the studios and us we are all working very closely together to give it the sense and the direction which we need to create it into a great training program what matters is that we create something which is relevant to the studios and for that we are not looking at this as a pnl exercise we are looking at this as a studio centric initiative which means that every studio will own their team in india and if you are owning something you can give it the direction and, and, and the structure that you want the framework you want you can create a culture that you want because that's the team which is going to be your extended team so even the client relationships the sensibilities of that can be brought into that team so we are all very excited simply because we can see see the results of what is what we have started doing even now and that's a great thing simply because it is telling us that whatever we are doing is working so what we are working on is a three fold a, a, i would say a, a three stage strategy short term mid term and long term we are looking at what we need today what we'll need tomorrow and what we'll need day after so this will ensure that a growth map that we are talking about of keywords as a whole and the direction that keywords is taking is exactly where we are moving because that is something which we are all working towards that create a talent pool which is really going to be relevant for us today tomorrow and day after and we are all looking forward to it thank you okay so uh that's uh, obviously, the, the, what we're looking to do is build on those academies and, and the, the India story. Um, I'm going to bring us back into the room, actually, to, um, uh, if you remember, I showed, it's sort of, this is a story about India and Ireland. Uh, and we've got John Gibson in the room, who leads our uh, Electric Square Studios. Hi, John. Um, and John, you joined us in uh, 2018, but I just wonder if you want to pick up on, um, you know, expanding that story and also the other talent development development activities. Yeah, under, thank absolutely. You. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'll stand off this side of the stage so that we're the same height. Um, <laughs> uh, um, I still think you're taller than yeah. me. <laughs> actually, actually, yeah, I, I probably am. Um, so the biggest problem facing us at Electric Square right now is onboarding new talent. Um, and it's an industry wide problem. It's not it's not unique to us. So um, you know, we believe the solution to that is academies and boot camps. And I've been told to go over this, one, oh, so I apologize. Okay. There you go. Um, so we believe we believe the solution is academies and boot camps, and that's why Destination India is is a great um, resource for us to tap into. You know, it, it, it's going to, and we're working with them at the moment to find the right sorts of grads for Electric Square because every studio has different needs, every studio has different requirements. So we can work with them to find the right sorts of grads, the best grads for Electric Square. So it's a no brainer for us to be able to tap into that resource. And, um, you know, it's proving um, it's, it's proving really successful already. So we're doing something similar in Dublin, which is which we're calling boot camps rather than academies. And the difference is whilst India are providing structured training to graduates in Dublin, we're targeting juniors. So we're looking at people who, who've already got experience, might be in a different sector. It might be that they're hobbyists. Uh, it might be that they're indie game devs and we're going to help them make the jump to AAA. So what we're going to provide in Dublin is structured um, kind of mentorship, um, on-site mentorship um, and a kind of structured career path and career progression. Now, why is this important? Well, there's this massive deficit well, uh, of talent in the industry, particularly engineering talent. And um, again, it's an, it's an industry-wide issue you know this is this is obviously um going to get worse as um as consoles get more powerful and development teams you know um the requirements of development teams are increasing in size so our solution to that is to onboard new talent so that's why we believe it's it's really really important when i first entered the games industry in the 90s uh, my boss told me the reason he hired me was because i played dungeons and dragons and my my cv was laid out correctly so basically it's because i was a massive geek who knew how to use microsoft Word. Uh, now it's obviously a lot harder. You need passion, you need skills, you need natural talent, and you need luck to get into the industry. So what we want to do is make it easier for those um, for those newbies, for that undiscovered talent, for those people to to join the games industry, 
because that's going to allow our business to grow. It's going to be great for the individuals and it's also going to be great for the industry as a whole. So, you know, it's um, the socially responsible thing we can do as keywords, a major player in, in, in this sector. Joe, back to you. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Thank that's you. great. Thanks. OK, um, so that's our very whistle stop tool. We've got, actually got lots of stories, but we've got very limited time. Uh, but, you know, I'd be delighted to talk to you later about any of those other stories. There's, there's so much going on within the studios that, as I said before, we want to want to surface. Now, um, are, are Mike and Vizar here? I don't know. Has anyone seen them? Hi, Hi how are you doing? Um, yeah, so I just want to shout out to um, uh, the team at uh, Waste Creative. Um, so that's one of our acquisitions that we made in December 2021. And just very recently, they were recognised as one of the top uh, 25 best small companies to work for in London, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice work, okay. <laughs> so congratulations on that as well. Okay, that concludes our tour. Uh, I'm gonna hand back to Bertrand. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Joe, for getting us through that. Well done on, on your first few weeks, effectively. Um, so I think you got a sense. This is really all about talent, talent, talent. Uh, that's the name of the game. That's the war we are on. Uh, as you can sense, we're also trying to take a different lens and to take a two to three year horizon so that we don't all go and fish in the same pond. I, I think the tour was very useful to me, at least to go to Ottawa, where you saw Snowden and Jean Sylvain really building up a team from 20 ish to 180 in the span of two and a half years. And with the ambition, I don't know if you noticed, know but the ambition of getting to 500 in the, in the coming years. And that's really what drives Jean Sylvain. And I think we have many more entrepreneurs. Uh, like those and where our platform can really enable that. Uh, to me, the, uh, the Katowice story is a great one because we got the chance, John and myself, to meet them very early. It's really a team of entrepreneurs. They were actually challenged by Andrew Day uh, three and a half years ago to say, it's never going to work in Poland. You won't be able to set up a team. And they were like, look, I bet you that we can put a first team of 20 within by the end of the month. And effectively, they had a team of 40 that you saw in the picture and now a thousand people, effectively a few years later. So I think a remarkable story. But it's not just theirs. Joe said it's also in Manila, uh, where we just crossed uh, 1,100 now, I think. It's also in Mexico, but also in conjunction with what we do in Canada, in conjunction with what we do in, in Dublin and others, and making the geo pool really work. Uh, and finally, I think I'm, I'm big on those academies, on the boot camps, uh, as Joe describes them, because that's how do we nurture the talent for the years ahead, both juniors and seniors. So very important topic for us in the years ahead. So on that note, I'll, we'll shift gear a little bit and I'll pass on to John to go a slight sideway on the adjacent market. Thank you very much, Bertrand. Um, yeah, so as Bertrand said, one of the areas that we have been exploring is uh, adjacent markets, uh, where we think there's a very natural opportunity uh, to uh, either expand some of our current offerings or naturally take our gaming expertise into some other verticals. And there are three areas that we wanted to cover today. The first is live ops, which is really more about expanding our offering to an area we think could be a really interesting growth opportunity. Um, the second is media and entertainment space. We've talked a little bit about that today. And finally, it would not be a presentation from a technology company with at least some reference to the metaverse. So turning to live ops first, I think ben Bertrand mentioned this in his intro charts. Um, the game development process has really gradually evolved over the last few years into what is often referred to as games as a service. You know, rather than developing a game, monetize it over a couple of years, and then release the new version, um, you're really seeing an increased use of games where the content is just constantly being iterated and developed further. It's been led by mobile, uh, but even AAA content is moving this way. And uh, probably the best example is Fortnite, where you've just got constant uh, content coming out all the time. We currently work on a large number of these games, but we tend to offer our services as more like point solutions within each of the service lines. So I think Bertrand mentioned that we do a lot of the game development content work in high voltage for Fortnite. Um, we've been testing Zynga cards in Montreal for numbers of years, but we don't really pull that together and go to market as a, as a live ops offering. And clearly we can do everything within that content production cycle. We can do the game development, the art, uh, we can test it, we can localize it. And then once the game's up and running, we've got the capabilities with our friends from Waste, 
with really strong community management capabilities and obviously our player support offering to really provide that, that full suite of services. So we think there's an opportunity to really bring that together uh, to provide a full live ops end-to-end -end service and to de develop this further, we've just launched our first live ops offering in the UK. Actually, John has been spearheading that in Lively. We've got other pockets within the business where we're already doing this to get together. And I think this is just a, a really good opportunity to go to market with a slightly different proposition. So expect to see a little bit more from us on that uh, going forward. The next one's media and entertainment. Um, we've talked about this for a while um, in most of our meetings with you guys. Um, and really what we mean by media and entertainment is the broader TV and film space. Um, this is a, a bit of a quantification of the market. It's not as big as, as games, but it's still a large market. And it's one that's been growing very fast uh, and it's predicted to almost be $150 billion by 2025. Um, this just feels like a very natural adjacency for us. The content production process is not the same, but it is similar. Uh, and we're seeing increasing convergence at the customer level. Um, but we've also seen the media and entertainment market increasingly using game engine technology in the content production process itself. And this makes it very interesting for us. So if we move on to the next chart, this is what we see going on. So video games has always been right at the top of that technical pyramid in terms of interactive content. And we're seeing more and more of that technology bleeding into the broader media and entertainment space, particularly the use of game engine technology to develop the content. Uh, whether that's at the previous stage where the engines are being used to render the film or the TV shows before it gets shot in real life, or in the example of the Mandalorian uh, franchise series, where actually everything you see in the background of that, uh, of that TV show has been rendered by the, the game engine. It hasn't gone through the traditional filming process subsequently. And we heard from John Doyle at Riot uh, earlier today with their Arcane franchise, which is really bl blending the concept of TV and games even more. But as well as technical convergence, You've also got areas like localization where the process is essentially the same and we're able to cross-utilize uh, our studio infrastructure. And further down the line, with the emergence of the metaverse, whatever that ends up being, we see, we see more and more convergence uh, of more traditional media towards games and even more demand for digital content. So moving now to uh, dubbing and subtitling, uh, the dubbing and subtitling market, which is essentially what we refer to as localization in games. Again, this is a large market. It's forecast to grow to $4 billion by the end of 25, of which about 1.7 billion is spent on new uh, content, localization of new content, which actually makes it a bigger market than the market for localization in games. Um, led by LED Powers, Bertrand mentioned earlier, We've been quietly building out our capability over the last few years. Uh, we've been able to cross-utilize our recording studios that we use for games so that we can um, use that space to uh, localize and do the audio content for TV and film. And it's grown quite quickly. We've now got about, I think, six of our locations that have been accredited, for example, to work on Netflix content. Um, and um, it's grown quite quickly into a business that uh, delivered 16 million of revenue in 2021. And we think there's an opportunity to expand that further, either by leveraging the keywords footprint further, so places like Mexico, Brazil, Spain, France, but also we're looking at some of the acquisition opportunities, a bit like we did with the games, to build out that global footprint further so we can create that one-stop shop for localization within the TV and film space as well. Moving into virtual production, said a bit about this earlier, but we really see virtual production as having the power to disrupt the traditional production model within TV and film. It uses the power of the game engines uh, for previs, virtual sets and characters and real-time animation. And again, it's a pretty large market um, with something like $17 billion being spent on new content creation, of which about 10%, 1.7 billion, is being uh, delivered through some form of virtual production. Uh, and it's forecast to grow pretty quickly. It's actually forecast to pretty much double uh, over the next um, seven years or so. And we clearly have a very strong capability in this space. Over 
2,700 specialists within our create services business who are experts in using game engines in order to deliver digital content. And it's actually something we're already doing. Uh, we think quite an exciting opportunity. Clearly, we don't want to distract ourselves in games. And as we said, we're finding it hard to find the talent for games. But we think this is an area that we can naturally uh, move into. So hopefully we'll see a few more examples. So I'm going to stop there. I'm now going to hand back to Bertrand, who has promised in two minutes he's going to explain exactly what the metaverse is. <laughs> That's unfair. <laughs> okay, two minutes for the metaverse. Ready? Um, so... Part of, I mean, I know there's a lot of hype in the sector, but I think we really have a, an opportunity here to play our role in a proper way without uh, breaking the bank of taking too much of a massive risk. I think there is a very nice definition of the metaverse here by the drum. The metaverse doesn't exist. You're talking about gaming. I think it's very true. When we talk about Web3, it's really everything that is happening from the gaming environment, from all that gaming DNA that John effectively uh, brought to life. And if you go back, so we're not planning at all to play in the infrastructure side. There are actors who have much deeper pockets as well, and those are risky propositions. But we are really planning on leveraging, or at least exploring to leverage the service lines we have. When you look at each of them, they just fit naturally. At the end of the day, if you want to create a space in Web3, you need game development. You need artists at probably a much bigger scale than we have ever even seen before to be able to do that. Hence the point about technology earlier. You'll need to think about QA in a very different way. You need to think about QA, live QA, based on the type of volume and dimensions you'll get there. Look at what we do in player support, player engagement. It lends itself perfectly for that because you need those interactions real time with the players, understanding where the VIPs, how to guide them through the experiences and an end. In truth, we're already getting a lot of approaches and pull quite naturally through different of those logos that you see on there, but also several brands reaching out. We have had a, a recent example with Prada and Ubisoft where, as part of a game, we create an entire store uh, presence in there. But it's also big retailers. There are some coming to us with 60 million SKUs, thinking about how do I get ready for that space? How do I even digitalize those assets for when Web3 effectively happens before even knowing what the answer of what it could be afterwards? So uh, I'm absolutely no means do we want to play in the architectural piece, but we want to play in the space where we, at the very least we ought to be thought leaders, to be able to help the publishers, to be able to help non-endemic gaming brands to navigate from that when they knock at the door. So the first step is to look at a consultancy agency type of approach, but we're seriously looking at how do we bring a few of the elements we have across those service lines to create sort of a meta studio which includes some production and some development capabilities behind. So I think we'd be totally remiss not to explain, to at least explore that in a proper way. But again, we'll venture in that with the proper stage gates. So two minutes for you, John. Um, so <laughs> on this, I think the recap of this section, uh, live ops seems to be a very natural one. And you've seen there is already a studio that we went live one at GDC, thanks to, to John's help, uh, called Lively. But it's at the very core of what we do. And actually, we absolutely don't want to miss that boat. We are perfectly centered to be able to take that on. Again, listen to Jim Ryan and how much of a move they're making to live ops. It's a big part of the business, at the very core of our business going forward. And the rest of what you've seen, I think what I'm proud of so far is we've been very diligent not to go too much left, too much right. The things we have seen in terms of m and &E, dubbing and subtitling, the things we have seen in uh, virtual production, we already do those today. It's just that we do those at a subscale level based on customer demand. But the customer is really coming very strong at us. So... Uh, we just have to think now of how much do we want to accelerate, how do much, much do we put the focus on those. And there are plenty of things on which we've passed. When we looked at that stream at first, we had an incredibly long list of things we could do in learning, e-learning capabilities, into the military that you could do for simulation purposes, and, and, and. The, the list is very, very long. But I think we've taken a, a, a disciplined approach to get going and to put the right footstep basically in that area. So on that note, I'll pass back to you, John, to go through M&A before we go on a, on a session on closing. Fantastic. Thank you, Bertrand. Right, we showed you this chart earlier, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but it just demonstrates how important M&A has been to the way that we built out our platform. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time today just trying to outline how we approach M&A uh, and some of the areas that we're looking to focus on going forward. So with that in mind, I'm going to be, this is the shortest uh, uh, sort of stage performance in the world because I'm going to hand straight over to Nuno uh, Lopez. Um, Nuno joined the business, I think about four years ago. Uh, he leads all of our M&A origination. Um, and I'm going to let him introduce himself, but I think he's, um, 
He's responsible for at least 30 of our acquisitions. So arguably uh, has an amazing impact on shaping the business into what it is. So I'll hand over to you, Nuno. Thank you very much, John. Uh, when the CFO gives you kindness and generosity, you take it. And so I'm going to take the very kind words of John. Well, start by talking to you about how we see and think of M&A about our keywords. And it's probably with this M&A vertex that has really a foundation layer that looks at why we do it, what we target and why we target it, and lastly, what we're looking for. On top of that, we add a foundation of process or a layer of process, if you will, that goes from origination up to integration. And this results into what is the execution of our M&A program. So if I take you on a little bit of a journey with me and start by why we do it, it's for a number of reasons, uh, all of them somewhat interconnected. And starting by, we do it because it is a very effective tool to execute on building the keywords platform. Now, part of that exercise of building the platform is adding capability, it's adding talent, technology, relationships. And when we do that, we're accelerating growth profitably. And now as we grow larger and larger, there's, a, there's also a, a driver for us to acquire, to strengthen our market and leadership position. And ultimately, we do it because we, with the knowledge that we have, the landscape, we see the opportunity to deploy capital at valuations that are very attractive. Now, if I move on to the second block of that foundational layer, and if we look at the, the service lines that uh, we've heard today from Bertrand and John, and even some of the adjacencies that John uh, referred to a moment ago, and even the components within the, the service lines, there's a few dimensions that we look at. Uh, we look at capability, we look at geography, relationships, technology. And each of them has you know, more or less significance depending on, on the service line or the component. But ultimately, we look at these because we want to target expertise. We need access to talent and talent tools. We want capacity so we can serve and execute at scale. We want reach. We want to be able to reach into clients, whether existing ones or new ones. And we want efficiency, so we can deliver more, better, and faster. And so, as you've seen today with the acquisition of Forgotten Empires, game development and marketing, and as you've heard from Bertrand and John, are going to be very much uh, the focus of our, of our execution in the coming times. And transversely, technology across the business. Now, last block of that layer, what are we looking for? It's really a triumvirate of requests. The first one is culture. You've heard Bertrand today talk to you about the one keywords spirit. That's what we look for. We will look for studios and people who can embody that one keyword spirit. We want that entrepreneurial mindset, you know, humble but ambitious, shared in the same values that we do. Second one is quality. Well-established reputation studios, strong pedigree teams, people who have been exposed to high-profile titles and clients, repeat business. And lastly, performance. We want growth, we want profitability, we want teams with track record of delivery. We want people who are ambitious in their growth plans and they're really after taking the breaks off the studio. And you know, you're all sitting there and we want keywords to perform. Our clients expect us to deliver quality and our people expect us to preserve the culture that we've been building. And this is why we're only as strong as the next studio that joins Keywords. Now, I'm sure you were all very eagerly waiting for some numbers, so I don't want to disappoint. So to give you an idea, and mind you that this is indicative, we have a long list, as John mentioned today, of about 90 opportunities that we've identified in the market. And this comes out of our own effort of origination, screening the market, the, lens, the knowledge that we have, the landscape, studios are keywords that work with other studios and referred work today. Forgotten Empire is a good example of that. And there are others. You know, Wicked Witch in Australia is the same. And from there, we have about 30 opportunities at one point who, whom we are engaged uh, in assessing. And this trickles down to 10 roughly opportunities that we have uh, where we're having advanced discussions and ultimately three opportunities at one time were in due diligence stage. Now, all of this, when it's said and done, we have delivered about five to 10 studios joining keywords every year. 
uh, translating into about 50 to 100 million euros spend. And the, the screening process or the origination process, it's really driven by strategy, not emotion. It's built together with the service line with a very disciplined and methodical approach. Now, the last block on that process lay is really about the end-to-end the -end of it. It starts at origination, it ends at integration. And it starts at origination with very close relationship with the targets. We forge trust-based relationships. We expose them very early to people who have joined keywords before so they know what they're going or, or walking into. It's about the execution, a team that has been together for a long time, a very repeatable process, very well-established, disciplined, where we even start integration or thinking about that, and ends at integration with dedicated resource to onboard the people that come and join keywords. So we can carefully strike this balance about preserving the entrepreneurial DNA of the studios that come and join keywords, while allowing the keyword spine that you've heard Bertrand mention before to absorb those support functions so we can set foundations to scale the studios up. So it's really about a keywords exper experience for the people that join. And it's this methodical and disciplined approach that has allowed us to have this very high LOI to, to completion ratio. And so I'll probably end here and leave it to John. Thank you, everyone. Um, he says it's not an emotional process, but we do high five a bit when we manage to uh, execute on the uh, on the transactions. And actually, we've mentioned it a couple of times, but really delighted to announce our latest acquisition of Forgotten Empires uh, this morning. Um, it's a really high quality studio, game development studio, about seventy uh, engineers. Um, and they specialize in real-time strategy games. Um, they've also got some really interesting live ops experience. So just in case they're listening, I wanted to uh, send out a big welcome to Ryan, Bert and the team, and welcome to the uh, Keywords family. Um, so moving on, um, uh, we put this slide up before. As, as Nuna mentioned, we are focusing on game development. You've seen a lot of activity there, but we're also looking to build out our marketing capabilities. And uh, I think um, Bertrand uh, stole my, my line, but I, I genuinely think that this marketing could be a mini keywords. Um, it's got the same sort of service line verticals within there. So I think it's a really interesting opportunity to build that out. So I'm gonna hand over to uh, Tony, who, as Bertrand said, recently joined to lead our Engage service line. And uh, Tony's going to spend a little bit of time talking about what his within a week plan is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, John. Um, I think we're getting tight on time. Now, the good news is, as a new boy with only five weeks in, I haven't got a whole lot to say. So hopefully I can make up <laughs> a little bit of time. But it's obviously the practical joke. The service line for the new boy comes at the end. You've got no time. So, um, so yeah, five weeks in, not very long at all. Um, but, you know, it feels like home to me. And I'm delighted I joined after really quite a lengthy time at WPP. And the reason I'm so excited is not just the opportunity of the whole keywords, which I saw, but particularly the opportunity we have within the Engage uh, service line. Uh, the chart you saw before, we've obviously combined marketing services with player support uh, and research into uh, the combined Engage unit. Why? Because it kind of makes sense. I mean, we've touched on that. You would want them sitting together uh, in the way that we've put them together. And there are obvious synergies, as both John and Bertrand mentioned. But I think what excites me is the combination of these units uh, or, or disciplines uh, allows us to give a, a much more holistic marketing offer to our clients. And I think that's a holistic marketing offer that they need. And I think it's one we're very well placed uh, to deliver. So I'm just going to make three observations. I haven't, we haven't really worked, determined exactly how Engage works, but three quick obs observations in five weeks. Um, we've got amazing studios and brands. Um, we've got incredibly uh, talented people. A lot of the brands we know, they're world-class brands. Uh, and we, you know, th that's a fantastic starting point. Great leaders uh, and fantastic people, over 2,000 people around the world. I think most critically, though, we have deep vertical gaming expertise. And I think that is critical as we move forward. Um, the quality of the work is really strong. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, uh, and I'm really impressed with the quality of work I see. Um, you've seen some of it. Uh, we, it. You'll see some more. Spoiler alert, little video at the end. Uh, the work's great, and you'll really see the creative quality of the thinking <laughs> and the delivery. The third point I'll make is, whilst being highly entrepreneurial, 
The studio leaders are also highly collaborative. They want to work with each other to get the expertise which each brings. And I think what Engage will do is really kind of make that collaboration work easier. So I'm really excited about that. We move on and turn where we're looking. Um, if you kind of, this chart shows the end-to-end -end Marcom's development cycle, if you like. Um, how do you go from kind of go-to-market strategy through to always-on brand activity? Um, and clearly, we are very well represented in certain areas. We've got huge content de uh, development, origination, delivery skills. And I think we've got great pockets in other areas. We've got strong PR. Uh, we've got um, community management. I think it's very interesting. Waste has been uh, referenced before. What we're doing with Waste is integrating that team with player support, and they're producing some really interesting work. And I think we want to build on that. Um, so we've got pockets of other work, really strong content. I think that's relevant. If you said Bertrand said it's all about content, so I think in an area that's pretty important, we've got a lot of uh, talent, but we can clearly need to build in these other areas, and we've highlighted some of those in blue. And to Nuno's point, what we're going to do is obviously look at those companies that fit our overall operational and cultural uh, uh, requirements, but obviously play specifically in these areas that we're short in, but also they must have games expertise. I think that's our DNA, that's what differentiates us from the competition, and that's where we should go hunting. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through all of these. We've also covered some opportunities that the metaverse will throw up. Clearly, we're interested. Live ops, we've talked about virtual production. Clearly, those are areas we would be interested in. I think just a couple of others. Um, I think in terms of influencer marketing, that's really important for our clients. Uh, um, so we are looking for players there. I think the key area there, they need to be players that are scalable. Some of them aren't. We need ones that are scalable. Also, they need to have a platform that can help us automate and also provide live dashboard feedback to how those assets are performing. So we're definitely looking in that area. Data and analytics, it's huge. It's a huge area. I think the opportunity for us is to find uh, specialists who are rooted in games who can help us with the initial primary research through to post-campaign analytics. So we'll look there. So quick speed stop for me, trying to make up time and you. Um, what I would say, I agree, many keywords engage. I think the opportunity to give clients an end-to-end -end marketing uh, uh, solution is huge. I think we can do it better than some of the traditional marketing groups, and I know a bit about some of those. Um, so really looking forward to it. I can't wait for week six. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Uh, so I'll speed up a little bit, but I think what you've seen is like we have uh, an M&A machine that is quite well organized behind. I would argue that it's very disciplined in the way that it effectively operates, uh, very clear in terms of uh, criteria we really want to work on. On a more, more personal note, what I have to, make, to look at it as well before joining. I wanted to make sure that there was really that healthy pipeline of acquisition, in, especially the very core and the bullseye of what we do in game dev, and I've been very impressed with, with what we have behind. When you think about it, it's not very surprising. When we only own really 5% of the market while being leading that market, it shows the potential that is ahead of us, but hence the discipline that is key. The other piece that struck me to me, if you join this section with before, is also how much of an inflection point there is when a new target effectively, new partner joins us in the first two years typically, which is very unique. Again, probably uh, speaks to the, the strengths of the platform that we have behind. Uh, so, and finally, you heard it from, from Tony, but the two key areas among the eight service lines overall uh, are really, uh, in terms of m and at least, are really game development. That's at the bullseye of what we want to do. We know the criteria are very clear. We are well established there. But also now a different challenge for Tony and team to shape of what could a mini keywords in Engage really look like. And beyond that, you'll see us as well making some moves uh, probably on the M&A side and partnering side on technology. That's also a natural one. And, and as we're looking at adjacencies as well. So I think it's time to bring us home. For that, we have one last section that John will largely uh, cover, and I'll come back at the end. But I just wanted to situate where we are right now. So you remember this slide earlier. Uh, we aspire to be game makers. We think we really have a unique play to have to really be game makers into the overall ecosystem. Uh, we think that there is really a compelling flywheel uh, that we are perfectly operated for right now. Our job is how do we make those five work streams and m &A really work to make sure that we get that wheel spinning in full strength. So now it's time for uh, John to translate that in terms of financial terms and what does it mean from a growth model point of view.
Fantastic. Thank you, Bertrand. So this is the last session before we wrap up. Um, so thank you very much for bearing with us. Um, I guess this is sort of a different wheel, but really wanted to um, take everything we've heard today and translate that in what we're referring to as our financial growth model for delivering shareholder value. And if we go look at this chart, I really see it as a compounding model with four key components, which we'll cover in a little bit more detail over the next couple of charts. So at the top, as you've seen, we've got some really strong structural growth drivers for our business. Uh, and we see, you know, 10% organic growth as a baseline expectation for the business going forward. I mean, as a baseline, you've seen we've been growing faster than that, but I don't think that's an unreasonable baseline target for us. Um, the business has been operating at a 15% margin level. We're going to continue to run the business in a disciplined way. Uh, but at the same time, we do want to invest behind some of these growth opportunities that we've been talking to today. And I think we can do that within that kind of 15% margin construct. Um, we're a naturally cash generative business, uh, and that then provides us with the capital to reinvest back into the M&A and the wheel goes round and it spins. And so if we look at each in turn, as we've shown, we're very fortunate to be operating in an industry that's grown very strongly and is forecast to continue to do so. We've got a large TAM of $11 billion that's forecast to grow even faster, uh, driven by this increasing trend to outsourcing. Uh, but despite being the market leader, we're still a relatively small share of that $11 billion. So I think there's an opportunity there. And I think we're uniquely placed. Um, we're the only truly global full service provider in the market. Uh, and there's an element of scale begets scale. Uh, and so I do think we've got a great opportunity to leverage those relationships uh, and convert them into real strategic partnerships. And as you can see on the right hand side of the chart, we've got a strong track record of delivering that kind of double digit growth sort of level. And on to margins. Um, as you can see on the right hand chart, uh, the business has been operating at around a 15% margin for a number of years. Uh, and as we have said, they've been a bit flattered recently for a number of reasons, and we do expect them to trend back to that sort of 15% level over time. We've got some really strong service line structures. We're gonna drive operational excellence through those structures. Um, we're gonna invest in the technology to do that. Uh, and we're gonna invest in our regionalized back office uh, platforms through Nick and his teams uh, in order to hopefully over time drive out even more efficiencies. Uh, but we're also gonna to continue to invest in the talent in the organization, uh, whether that's developing game development talent, whether that's uh, developing the talent that we need to be able to land these more strategic partnerships, these more strategic relationships. Uh, and finally on inflation, um, there's no doubt that we're in a more inflationary environment at the moment, but we can use pricing in a responsible way to alleviate this pressure. Closure is James. Uh, and we also have access to lower cost locations where we can offer uh, our services where price is a little bit more sensitive. In terms of cash flow, as I said, we're a naturally cash generative business. Um, we've got relatively low capital requirements. Our capex tends to be more what I refer to as revex, um, with capex typically around three to four percent of revenue. I think over the next few years we might be at the upper end of that range as we invest behind some of the things that we talked about, and that then provides, as I said earlier, the organic funding for our M&A agenda. And we are going to continue to build out the platform but we're going to maintain that discipline that we talked about today. Very targeted approach, uh, particular focus on game dev and marketing. But as Nuno said, we're also looking at some of the technologies that we might be able to bring into the business through M&A. Uh, we've got an interesting one that we're looking at at the moment on the testing side, uh, and also some of the adjacent market opportunities that we talked about where there are some interesting players out there that we think can really supplement what we've got. Given the nature of M&A, it's very difficult to predict how much we'll be doing, but I see 50 to 100 million euros as a pretty typical level, but clearly it could run higher than that, uh, particularly if we execute some of the larger opportunities that we do have uh, in our pipeline. And just on resilience, you know, I think we've demonstrated through COVID that we are a pretty resilient business. As Bertrand said earlier, we've got an increasingly sticky 
revenue, really good long-standing relationships with our clients, and we're increasingly embedded into their workflows and their processes. We really do see ourselves as an extension of our client teams. And the video industry itself has been pretty, proven to be pretty resilient uh, in times of economic downturn. You know, as I think you said, Bertrand, earlier, it is one of the lowest cost forms of entertainment. If you look at it in terms of pound per minute, um, it really is a very low cost form of entertainment. And some of the monetization models that I think the publishers have now uh, arguably make their player base a bit more sticky as well. And we've got a very strong balance sheet. Um, we recently increased the size of the RCF to 150 million euros. Uh, and with the cash that we've got, that gives us plenty of liquidity to invest in the business and to execute on the M&A strategy. Just to summarize, um, we're going to continue to build out the platform through a combination of organic and M&A investments, enhancing the service lines, investing in technology and capacity, and continuing to drive the M&A agenda with that discipline focus. And as I say, targeting uh, marketing, game dev, technology, and also the adjacencies. So finally, before I hand back to Bertrand, um, I joined the business a little under three years now, uh, and we've, I think we've just about doubled the size of the business in that time. Um, I, I, I think there's every reason uh, to see Keywords as a billion dollar revenue business. And with that, I'm gonna hand back to Bertrand to tell you how long it's gonna take. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not enjoying those transitions, but... Uh... <laughs> I'll skip to the next one. So just in terms of outlook, uh, we have had a, a very positive start uh, of the year of 2022 so far, very strong on the organic uh, growth, as we announced this morning for the first uh, four months. I think that gives us a good position and good comfort level as well to reiterate uh, our confidence in, into a performance being in line with expectations this year with really good buffer as well behind. Uh, we're well placed as well to continue the investment into everything we've been talking about in terms of platform, in terms of uh, the capabilities you have seen, we're also trying to take a two to three year lens really on quite a few of those streams as well. Uh, also, uh, continuing to steer towards that uh, strong margin uh, at roughly 15%. Now, clearly, you all know and you can sense from the discussions that there is probably some tailwinds uh, upside potentially on the, on the mix that we have, hopefully with the, especially with game dev. Uh, if you take the technology investments that we're making, hopefully should help on that. But I think it's only right to be, uh, to be at the right level by talking about 15% or at least north of 15% while keeping the breathing space to make those type of investments uh, across the group. We're well funded overall to deliver the acquisitions we talked about. John just touched on it. I mean, that's a very healthy, healthy position, especially in the current markets where cash is king. And I think we could be in, in, well, in great position, even better competitively to, uh, to keep M&A and organic growth uh, approach, and well positioned to take the business to the, the next chapter. Uh, some called it, I think, Jeffrey's uh, KWS 2.0, which certainly resonates. And so maybe on, on a more personal note to, to really wrap this up, uh, if I had to put myself in, into your shoes, and which actually I sort of had to, uh, if you go back almost a year ago, when I had to decide, of, do I want to invest in this business, my own career, my own uh, time uh, as such, there are four things that really uh, jumps to mind for me. Uh, the first one is that there is a lot of runway. Uh, I think, I hope you get that message across from today. It's a, we're a clear market leader, but it's a big market on which at the end of the day, we are still only 5% of what could be ahead of us, which I think certainly I find very, very exciting. Uh, John used the word, we are the picks and shovels in, in this business. So as an investor, I think the gaming market is very buoyant, is uh, incredible. It's probably a place I would want to be, but with us, you don't even have to take the risk on the hits and misses associated to the individual titles of the publishers. We're sort of a diversified portfolio that gets you exposure to the overall gaming uh, industry and even beyond based on the capabilities we have. Thirdly, to me, is the, the strengths uh, of the, of the, and the resilience of the platform. That's what we really wanted to demonstrate today, uh, that there is uh, talent behind, there is really a platform, there is uh, a, a push for a flywheel. We're on a good position from a cash point of view, good position in terms of uh, balance sheet, in terms of cash conversion. But more importantly to me is really that flywheel effect that we could really be triggering uh, over, the, over the next decade, frankly. Uh, and finally, we're in motion. Uh, we have a plan. We have the five work streams. We have, uh, you can sense all of them are really starting to come into actions. You've heard it from some of our some of our partners as well, from James, from Riot, from Microsoft, but it's many, many others across the top 25. Uh, but on a personal basis, I'm probably even more excited than I am 
now than I was when I joined. And more importantly, we have 50 leaders that have been fully boosted behind. This is our plan collectively. This is not my plan or John's. This is really the 50, 60 of us. And hopefully we are really in the phase where we're bringing 11,000 uh, key wardens behind us to really go and make this happen over the next few years. So John will join me as well. So we can take Q&A and think about this. There's a great cocktail, I I've been told, afterwards. So <laughs> 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 Go for it. Hi, firstly, thanks to everyone presenting uh, here and, and, and on screen. Um, uh, three questions, I'll try and be brief. Firstly, for John, on reporting, you'll now be reporting Globalize, Create. Correct. And with some profit figures There'll for those some divisions? Profit figures as well. In the, in the second half? Cool. Um, the second one was to say you're lying. Growth is going to be more than 10%. Margins are going to be better than 15 uh, Is it that the next round number is 15% and that's a bit punchy? Because on the, on the face of it, you know, you're saying the TAM is growing at 10%. Why wouldn't you expect to grain a bit of market share? I look at all those figures of employees going up to the right. Yeah, I mean, we're not, by setting out like that, we're not, um, setting out targets. We're trying to give a sense for how you might model the business. Um, you know, we've always talked about 10% as being that kind of baseline expectation. But as you've seen, we have grown faster than that. But we're talking about over the next five to 10 years. And so we're trying to put a level of um, sort of uh, prudence, if you like, into the way that we're presenting it. But certainly, um, we would set ourselves internally a target of being somewhere above 10%. Cool. And finally, um, on M&A, the cash you've got, you talk about 100 to 150 to 100 million. On that basis, you know, without even getting into an indebted position, it, you know, for instance, are we going to see you stop issuing stock or buy back what you issue? You know, because there seems no need to, to raise extra equity effectively. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we look at this all the time. At the moment, we, we feel that the best way of delivering shareholder value is to deploy the capital into the M&A. Uh, and at any one time, we have got a couple of larger ones that are on the list that, if we did do, would start to eat in to that cash and even move, move it uh, and need to leverage the balance sheet a bit. So we want to give ourselves the flexibility uh, at the moment. We think that's the best way of doing it. Clearly, we'll have to monitor it over time. Um, you may have seen that we did um, uh, propose a, a resolution to give us the ability to do share buybacks if we wanted to. We didn't have the ability before, but our focus at the moment is deploying that capital into the M&A. Thank you. Hi, R Richard Williamson from Edison. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, one of the points that I think Bertrand made earlier in, in, in the presentation was that, you know, you're in a unique position and were you to disappear, were keywords to disappear, it would make a, you know, it would have a big impact on the industry. That, that's fantastic from one perspective, but from another perspective, from the industry's perspective, is that reliance on keywords, is that, um, you know, again, I'll, I'll use the word monopolistic position, um, is that beneficial to the industry? So, you know, is there a thought that they should be developing a competitor or there should you know, be a competitor to keywords in the market? I, I totally see your point. In many industries uh, where you have only 5% presence and where there's such a road ahead, you would expect others to come in. And others you've seen on a third of the size are trying but, uh, and are setting up shop as well, but in specialty areas in general. So I wouldn't be surprised that the world keeps evolving on that front. I wouldn't be worried as a publisher to have an over-reliance. You've heard it as well, I think, from, from James, of how much there is a need there, quite frankly, because they just cannot pull it off just themselves to build actually those type of capabilities, and they don't want to in the first place. And that's the nature of discussion that I'm getting pretty much uh, everywhere across the industry right now. Uh, what actually probably the, the, the strongest point I have to, to your question is to me, we're still only 5% of this entire uh, piece of role. So I think we really have an opportunity to become something very special, but there's a long road to go. It's just at the moment, it's just perfectly done right now to build a strategic partnership, to build a platform, to build a technology as well, to be able to, to take that on and, and to run with it, quite frankly. So, uh, and the fact that there is not many competitors behind, to me, is a testimony to the work that Andrew Day and John and the team have done before to be able to build that platform almost in a super humble way, in a service centric organization without the, the entire world necessarily realizing. So all we can do right now is to keep running with it quite, uh, quite fast. And, and, and the prospect of somebody like Tencent with deep pockets coming around, knocking on the door and you know, 
potentially putting an offer? Is that something that you I'm, consider? I'm not aware of any of those. To me, honestly, I'm really focusing forward on what we can build ahead of us. I think when I talk about 10x figuratively, it's really the aspiration I have. I think with a few people I know well in the room who, who know me as well and who know that we've built together a mindset of 10x, that's really what I'm fully focused on right now, including in terms of investment, including in terms of the team we are building up. I hope you get an appreciation for what we're trying to do here uh, that is quite special. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ross from Investec. Yes, for you, Bertrand. I'll, I'll, I'll save you, John. Um, just a question regarding the depth of those 23 of 25 and of the, of the 10 of 10. Um, to what extent uh, are you waiting for some of those clients to professionalize their use of outsourcing versus your ability to actually drive that change? Yeah, that, that's a very important one. Because when I go back to the voice of the customer, it was if I go in more specifics, you have some, I think you heard it from James, right? James had a starting point of saying, how are we going to use professional outsourcer to really find the right blend between the two of us? And again, I reiterate, I don't like the word outsourcer because it feels at arm's length, but hopefully you get aware that there is really a, a joined up view of where our teams are really embedded with each other. So the solution architect, we're investing in those type of profiles to really make that happen together. So I absolutely don't want to be a bystander and just waiting for it. I think it's going to come our way anyway, but I really want to invest in being first in line to create those relationships. You have some others where they have 10 studios, and actually each studio decides independently. But more and more what is starting to happen is at a CXO, at a CEO level, starting to think about, this makes no sense. Why do I have that QA in each of my division individually? Why do I have that player support in each of my division individually? So the, you can sense the tension happening, and some are at different levels of, of aggressiveness around that or ambition around that, but we start having those discussions. There is one partner I'm not at liberty to, to share right now, but where we are looking across each of the service lines, across each of the studios, where could we do something that is much more holistic around that? That's a choice we have to make. Can we cater for that? Can we not cater for that? That's where all the pieces you've seen actually are coming together. So I think the short answer to your question is absolutely, uh, we want to prioritize that. Hence, the strategic partnership is all about that. The technology is also a key to be able to do that. Uh, look, Microsoft, what we have seen on that wasn't just a play to do that across Microsoft. It was a co-development of that platform so that once we do that, we can do that for Riot, we could do that for SharkMob, we could do that for Tencent overall or for Sony and others. Uh, so you'll see a certain ambition on our level to drive that. Uh, Will Wallace from Numis. Um, I want to ask a question on the technology uh, investment <coughs> and, and what are the... Um, what are, the, what are the limiting factors, really, on what you're spending on new technology? Is it that you want to maintain a 15% margin and you could blow through that? Or is it that you don't have the delivery capability? Or is it you don't have enough ideas as to what to spend it on? What, what's limiting you in terms of spending on technology? So we have, we have plenty of ideas. And, and part of what I'm trying to emulate, you could sense, was when I call it 10x across each of the service line leaders to drive that, is it is generally part of the job spec to go and drive that. So I'm looking for each of our service line leaders, and I think the ones in the, know, in, in the room know it very well, to come up with the ideas on that. Now, we want to do that with discipline, so that's why the 15% underpinning on, on adjusted BP, PBT comes in. I think we have room that we found actually to be able to, to honor that properly. There are some ways, not massive investment as such. There are some things where it was more a question of prioritization. Uh, when I opened up our own kitchen, hopefully what I was trying to showcase is we were probably doing too much, but it's subscale at all different places in a non-coordinated way. So how do we pick the five, six that really matter, where we can win over the next couple of years and really invest in that? So I don't think it's a mountain of cash where you would expect a major transformation compared to some retailers who had to really struggle to make the wave, as in my previous life, to get to the other end of it. I think here is the right evolution. Questions we have quite openly are more, are there some that needs to be acquisition or is it partnerships? Uh, we are meeting many partners there to really understand are we the best owner of that technology? Can we really pull it off and iterate on the product side? I aspire to be that type of company, but I want to be realistic of how fast we can move. So I think it's less on cash. It's more the capabilities and how much can we take on and where does it really move the dial, as you have seen with Scantan AI. But maybe one point I'll add, and, and John hinted to it, was also in terms of, of guidance overall. We've said game dev, marketing, but we've added technology to the list as well. So there will be a few where they will have a different profiles that what we have used the market too in terms of five to seven x ish, uh, in terms of, of multiple associated to that. But that's that's the bets that we the, the, the moves that we effectively want to make here and there. Hi, just uh, in terms of the game delays that have been happening in the industry uh, this year, yeah. how much of a tailwind if it is creates a tailwind for you, and and you know how would you long would you expect that to last? Well, I, I, it's a very good one. Yes, it is a tailwind. And our QA business, part of, of your question, I think, earlier, 
uh, and Jeffries was uh, um, uh, to, to join about the 10 percent is part of it. We're benefiting from a few one offs right now, especially on QA, where there's a lot of titles that came. And usually that's a piece of the business where we get the visibility latest. But it, it's really coming and it came very strong over the first uh, four months in particular. Can we completely reproduce that all the time? Probably not to that extent. Uh, this being said, I think there's a more structural trend there. So I've, I'm having the discussion with quite a few of the uh, studio president. I have one major one in mind right now where he's getting frustrated by the fact that each titles, even titles that are supposed to come on franchise on a yearly basis, you can probably guess, uh, actually have often even more than one year delay uh, behind that. So, uh, but that becomes structural because the expectation of the games uh, to land on the market are bigger and bigger. Uh, from a quality point of view on the back of Unreal 5, from the type of portability that is expecting now on all the different platforms, the market now to justify those investments, you expect now to be live on 20 plus languages from day one, hence those investments on there. So I think there is something structural there. And that's why I highlighted earlier the extra complexity you get in the business overall, that quite frankly, we are going to be the benefits, will be to our benefit. Now, we don't want it to be delayed. We want to come to the early stage of the solution proactively of where can we help bring tech into it? Where can we get volume that you couldn't handle before? If we can do that, to me, that's, that's a sweet spot. So, and just as another question, in terms of the talent shortages that are out there in, in the market, with the current pace of people joining the industry, how long would it take to fill that gap? And do you benefit in that time? And, and are you part of that ecosystem? So I'll probably separate a little bit Good to have your view as well, John. Mm -hmm. I'll separate a little bit the post-production side and the creative side. On the post-production side, what uh, I can, I'm stereotyping a little bit, but we are sort of an unlimited machine to some extent where we can really scale very strongly. You've seen Katowice was an example of moving from zero or 40 to a thousand in three years, waiting the same at three, four, five places around the world right now. So we have that capability to scale and to take the demand on that front. And those are discussions we're having with the, the business development team. It's like there, what's a cohesive offering? What's the technology? We can take as much as we can eat, frankly, on that front. On the creative side, especially on game dev, that's where the number one limiting factor uh, is really the game dev talent, and largely seniors, I would say. Uh, hence the investments we're looking into India about how can you take those million engineers and convert them on a three-year horizon by writing almost the curriculum, by really shaping them to the type of specs that make sense for uh, for what we need as well, for what the industry needs. Now, we have a healthy growth there. <coughs> Last year, you've seen 15% growth in our game dev business, but the cap was really due to talent on that front. Thanks. So that's what we want to unlock. Ed James from Berenberg. So I've got um, two questions. Firstly, some of your largest clients are going through a bit of a, it's called an operational challenge through unionization. So how does that affect your business in the way that you deal with unions? or increasingly so, and then how they are procuring your services. You know, has that changed as a result of that? So, in, in part of it, you, you're right, it's happening in the industry more broadly, especially in North America, Canada in particular right now. You've seen a few cases, you've seen a few cases within Keywords uh, as well the, uh, this week. Uh, you've seen Microsoft a few days ago, I don't know if you saw that, but announcing that unionization is part of the process and that uh, somewhere would be uh, a natural point of endorsing it as well. Uh, so we have, maybe for everybody's benefit, we have uh, a small case of that that we're experiencing right now. Uh, where in Edmonton, we have about 17 employees, 16 uh, employees. We decided to go and to, to mount a unionization effort on the back of that. It was announced this week. Uh, we definitely respect the uh, decision of our team at the end of the day. Uh, want to work closely with them. But I should probably caveat that. So this is very specific to Edmonton. It's 17 people, which is in the spectrum of 11,000 people. And it's a very specific business uh, called KES, uh, Keywords Embedded Services, uh, with, where we have some teams for historical reasons embedded actually with our clients as such. So it's a very bespoke piece of our business as such. Uh, our job, and, and part of it, frankly, there are things I'm still learning as well. There are some things where we could do better. Uh, in that case, for example, we had a miscommunication between us, our clients, on the working from home relationship. We, we could have done better than that. And we rectify that right away. But we're going to rectify that across the board of where do we need to take actions proactively around those. So we're going to learn from that. Uh, but overall, yeah, you'll probably see a trend uh, on that dimension. But that's why also we have a broader global footprint that I think we can use to advantage uh, more generally. And then slightly unrelated, um, the broadening out of the marketing services is somewhat more of a leap than some of the other service lines. So going into things like um, sort of user acquisition, performance marketing. Um, I'm just interested, 
you know, you've got a landscape where you've got Unity, Iron Source, App Loving doing user acquisition on mobile. You've got things like Petrol Advertising owned by Enac Global doing things, you know, more on the PC console side. You've got legacy uh, sort of agencies that, okay, yep. fair enough, aren't uh, video game specialists. But and you're doing this at a time where there's a lot of regulatory change within the media landscape as well. So, you know. How is this going to be built out and why do you think Keywords can build what is quite a specialist technology-led service line that is quite different to anything else that Keywords has essentially done? You know, programmatic advertising user acquisition is, is pretty specific. Yeah, I think I'm more optimistic than you are. I don't know where the end game will be. That's, that's the job that, that Tony <laughs> has to fledge. I'm not saying we're going to do the full 360. For example, are we going to be... Uh, a buying engine behind and having the technology that is behind? Probably not, I, I would, which is 80% of the spend, by the way, which is a pastoral. I would argue we're probably going to partner or to find the right shop that really fits f perfectly with what we have. So we'll be, I guarantee you, will be very, on my body, we'll be very, very diligent on that part of it. But gosh, there are opportunities. Uh, again, I'm just talking about the last six months, uh, talking to the, the C-suite, where uh, many, 15% of the SDNA is actually into marketing on that front. And it's very traditional. It feels very traditional compared to, in some areas, way more advanced in mobile, but then other industries which have already gone through that journey. So there is a piece in me which is, gosh, I want a piece of that action uh, one way or the other. And part of it is building the right piece. I'm not going to say, and that's why I, I, I flagged earlier, game dev, we know exactly what we're doing. It's the, the bullseye that we want, the type of uh, characteristic we want there. We'll have to really shape it up. That's why also getting Tony on board and partly coming from that background but take the influencer marketing, take uh, Visa and Mike on Waste, who, we, who joined the family in December last year, it already makes a big difference in the offering we have. Now we can play in influencer marketing, we can play in social, uh, and there are areas where we're strong. There are areas where in terms of trailers, not everybody can do that. We have five specialist agency in trailers. They're really in-game engine. There are plenty of uh, clients outside of gaming who are asking us, can I get, please, uh, get a piece of that? So I'm not over, arguing, but there are probably 30% where we are strong. There are probably 20, 30% where I already know we, we shouldn't get there, or at least we should get in partnership, including some that you're mentioning. But there is a, an interesting Wild West in which we probably want to also figure out how we can play in there. I don't know, Tony, if you want to add to that. But. So yeah, I mean, I think you've got to look specifically. I think some areas lend more, you know, influence marketing. I think that's a broader area, and we're looking for specific companies that, you know, as I say, can help us to automate. I think in the area you're talking about performance marketing, we are going to be more specific, has to be games related, and would be quite specific which part of that area would be interesting. Hi, um, I'm just going to relay a couple of questions from the people yep. joining remotely, if I may. Um, so first of all, we've got one from Nick Dempsey at Barclays. He says, um, given there's already a healthy net cash on the balance sheet, you often use equity to purchase part of bolt-ons and your model generates good cash, free cash flow. Are you undercooking things by only projecting 50 to 100 million of spend on M&A per year? I think we kind of covered that earlier uh, in a previous question. You know, we've given 50 to 100 as a kind of an indicative typical um, sort of level. I don't want to use the word bolt-on acquisition, but if you go back over the last few years we've been operating at that level but we have got two or three larger opportunities um, that we've been looking at that could consume quite a lot more cash if we decided to go there um, so and, and that 50 to 100 million would not accommodate one of those so I would see that as the the sort of the typical with the potential to spend more um, if we if we went after some of these larger ones just to a quick question from Tom Singlehurst um, at City, um, referring to the slide 10 where you talk about 133 clients using three or more of your services, but can you tell us what the overall client count is and therefore work out what, what percentage that represents? Yeah, no, I can, I can share. I think we have 950 clients at last count uh, that I'm aware of, and there are indeed 130 that are using three plus of our services. And if you take the top 10, uh, most are using six plus of our services. What I was trying to illustrate earlier is like beyond the numbers, there is a lot of opportunity to be right now. Those are largely studios one to one that goes to them. So we can coordinate that much more and offer much more value across the studio. I think that's what James was bringing to, to life in space on that front. Open the agenda to 2026, look at the five, six titles, AAA that are coming or the mobile portfolio. We can do something that is way more meaningful. And frankly, that's where 
that's the, the, the break to me that we've, we're only 512 million right now is largely due to that. So that's per, personally what uh, John and myself want to unlock. This is actually another couple from Tom. So can you talk about utilization of your developer base? How much can you grow just by using your existing workforce more effectively? Um, we've actually been running probably hotter than we should be over the last couple of years. As I said, it's not the challenge on that side has been bringing talent in to the organization and that's been a limitation on our growth. I think we've grown about 15% organically for the last couple of years and that kind of feels about as fast as we can um, organically in terms of that talent acquisition piece. In terms of utilization, it's something we monitor um, a lot. Um, typically, we would look to run that business at about 85% utilization. Um, we've been running higher than that. We've been running more at 90%. So actually this year, we quite intentionally uh, budgeted to have a bit more utilization uh, across the business gives us the ability to react a bit better when we get client demands coming through. Um, but uh, we've been busy, so we're back at 90% again. So, um, you know, as I say, the big, the big opportunity, the big challenge there is how can we get more game development talent into our organization so that we can uh, scale that faster. And even to add an extra lens to that, it's not, there's a certain level of granularity that is interesting as well. It's not uh, every single developer is also the most senior ones are the ones that are most in demand across the market based especially on game engine and sophistication that's where studios like high voltage are incredibly valuable as well because you have deep expertise in um, uh, in unreal 5 almost a year and a half before you really get deployed to the market that's a super super skills then like in a consulting model you can attach a lot of juniors or or talent that is growing actually through them as well so we, we're trying to be very targeted even in the academies of which profiles do we need most? Because they allow us to unleash some of the constraints on the so, utilization. There is one, I think, opportunity for us. Um, at the moment, we tend to manage, if you like, utilization at the studio level. Yeah. Um, and you know, we talked about technology. One of the benefits of getting all of our game development studios on one workforce planning system is the ability to potentially utilize across studios a bit more than we do. We do do a bit of it, but it's not the norm. So we've got at least a couple of projects where we've created a team by taking 10 from one studio, 10 for another and combining it, but it's not something we do sort of automatically. I think once we get that workforce planning solution in place, we can start to be a bit more creative about how we pool teams. And I think that will unlock some utilization opportunity for us. Uh, but we're not, we're not quite there yet, but that's, a, I think, something that, that maybe comes down a little bit further down the line. Yeah, uh, Patrick Adon, good buddy. A uh, question on pricing, actually. Look, we've heard a lot in the past that, you know, keywords hadn't really pushed the channel here. Um, just interested in what some of the initiatives of late across service lines, in terms of given your strategic, you know, positioning in the industry and what you're doing on price. If you could just give some uh, context on that. Yeah, I'll start maybe with one element that is interesting that I didn't realize. Price has been, we, we partly answered the questions, price has been, not in the top four of the priority criteria for most of our clients right now, certainly in areas that we're talking about in terms of the creative, which is very interesting. I didn't expect that. I was with my armor when I went to visit most of, of the clients, thinking, okay, uh, careful of how you're going to address that when you give the visibility across of the, all of the studios. Actually, it hasn't been the key consideration. It's really about access to resources, especially those seniors as well. It's the ability to mobilize very quickly the geographic footprint and the flexibility you can offer and then more creative solutions around that, and price comes after that. So Now, price is obviously important, but in a world of inflation, this has put us in a position when supply is so much lower than demand that we have a treasure of 11,000 talent into the company, of being in a position where we can have those discussions and where our partners really want those resources as much as, as everybody wants them. So this has allowed us as well to, to start having those discussions. Now, I cannot overcome it because we're in the beginning of that world of hyperinflation right now, who knows how long it's going to, to last, you know better than me. But as part of that, at least the first signs are that there's a good ability to really have those discussions as true partner and to pass, uh, to pass that on. Yeah, I think, that's, um, I think that's super important. The other thing, um, you know, it's, it's a very, very client-centric service sort of culture that we have. And I think with that, the, the businesses are very respectful about pricing as well. So, um, you know, a lot of these teams have been working with each other very, very closely. And when you know, we're experiencing some, some labor inflation, so are our customers. And, and they, we need to work together 
on that. So I think it tends to be quite a constructive, I'm talking more on the creative side here, but it tends to be a pretty constructive conversation because we're all kind of in it together. And all we want to do is help our customers, help our clients deliver their content and deliver their, their objectives. So, and I think pricing just becomes one part of that conversation. But the even more important piece to me is that that's what we try to illustrate with the strategic partnership and bear with us because we are early on that journey. I genuinely believe that it's only now that we can really have those because until you had game development art, the full service lines, the geographic footprint, it was tough to really have it. But the real play to us is not a binary discussion on pricing and who takes it on. It's really a discussion of how do we create way more value together as part of that. Hi, thanks. Um, Anna McDonald at Amati. Um, your NPS scores, you talked about that going from, I think, 22 to 44, you said. 42. But um, when um, Jean Sylvain from Snow Lynn Studios came on, he talked about 78%. So that implies that it does vary quite a lot across the group. So can you talk a bit about how you think about that and how what your targets are and how that might, how this new forming into three divisions might affect employee morale? Because you know, we're all aware there's a massive battle for talent out there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So the 22 to 42 is on aggregate level, including COVID, which interesting in many firms around the world, in a bizarre way, at the entry stage of COVID, ENPS worldwide has increased. Uh, part of it is because of the flexibility of working from home, much more flexibility in what I want, not having to spend 50 minutes to the office. And then so it's I that in previous places as well. Uh, you're right. We're looking at it uh, per type of studio, per type of service lines. You wouldn't expect to see 42 is actually a super healthy benchmark. I don't know if, if you're running across your own firms or your own portfolio. Uh, in the industry, this is really, really high up, uh, many on negative territories. Um, but you'll have differences in two uh, post production areas, which were a much more entry job, second job, post of uni shorter term placement, think about our testing player support as is right now, meaning that we want to enhance that, where it's much more the value that you can drive with the inside and others. In the more creative side, and certainly on game dev, you'll have more pressure, for example, because those guys are in, in high demand across the industry overall. But the high NPS often is a reflection of those teams have been together for a very long time. That's why I want to be very respectful of the local entrepreneurship that Jean Sylvain creates, that High Voltage creates, that uh, Happy Harren creates, that Volta creates, they have really something magical in the way they do that. And many of the teams, the acquisitions made overnight as well and Forgotten Empire, I think they have one person that it ro rotates over the last 10 years or something like that. So it's really a, a group, a band of brothers that has been very, very close. The trick and our biggest job is how do we keep that absolute entrepreneurship, that strength, but how do you give them the right backbone? And there is a massive appetite to collaborate more. How do we enable them much more to do that? The biggest mistake we could do is to come up top-down governance here is all of our resource. The 90%, we could optimize it to 100% fairly quickly by just putting it together. That would be a big mistake. So how do we make sure we find a subtle blend basically in that? That's also why I wanted to have the studio in my leadership teams. That's why you see so many studio leads as well in here, because that's where the rubber really hits the road and the truth come at the end of the day uh, in there. So we want to have those discussions very openly. But, but you're right, there will be differences per type of businesses like there is in any, in any other world or, or any other type of industries as well. And it's in our incentives as well, so we're yeah, <laughs> we're measuring on that as well. Oh uh, yeah, thank you, it's, uh, James Lockie from Peel Hunt. Um, follow up actually from Anna's question on NPS. Is it? I, I've heard on other companies that are global, NPS scores can differ by geography as well because there's different cultures and, and things like that. Is that is that? Are you seeing that as well? Uh, uh, absolutely, you're absolutely right. And part of it as well is like take uh, areas like Manila. I think we are in it's the seventies as well. For example, we have eleven hundred team over there, you go there, it's buzzing, it's an incredible energy. We are one of the biggest job providers, one in an area where the jobs are not that easy to find as such. The conditions are really well done compared to most employers in the region. It's way less competitive. So you're absolutely right. So it's a horses for course. We did an analysis at the board recently where we looked at each of the key geographies, where the benchmark for that industry, for that segment, for the region as well specifically. Uh, and then part of it is to find the right blend overall and also the flexibility to keep adjusting. I want to have happy, happy employees well paid at the end of the day. So uh, if you want to stay for the next 10 years, uh, we'll invest in that properly. But we have levers that we can use as well. So on the M&A box, uh, I noted there wasn't a tick next to game development technology as a sort of a, as an option. Is that because you, you feel you've got the capability in inside to, to, to build up that side or do you not see that as being as value add to shareholders as some of the other 
cap- I think, areas? I, I think it's more about what we're prioritizing within those service lines. So within game development, we're trying to we're trying to bring in capabilities, we're trying to bring scale, we're trying to bring geographic footprint. Technology, actually, a lot of the time, we're working on our clients' technology stack. So we, all of the game development studios will have technology, they'll have workflow systems that they use. That's not what's really driving um, that service line. It's the talent and the people and the customer relationships. Whereas in some of our other service lines, you know, we can, we've, we've shown that we can expand and grow our testing capability organically. We don't need to buy businesses as much to be able to build and expand. So Katowice are going from zero to a thousand, India growing very strongly. But what we do and we are interested in is, is how can we add technology to the services, either to make the services better, um, be able to test more, more of the game, um, yep. or how can we bring in technologies to make us more efficient? So it's, it's more about the relative prioritization within the service line rather than the fact that we're not necessarily focused on te- technology. But, but it's a good catch. I'll, I'll go back and have a look and have a discussion with Jamie because Jamie might be tempted. There's a piece in me with 1,500 engineers. So, and, and with Ashley, you've seen earlier, Gosh, that's a gold mine and highly specialized. That's way more than your average, even Google engineer in there. So surely there's a piece of me, how can we do more? That's Jamie's job as well, to figure that out across the service lines. But I, I suspect part of the reason why you didn't see that tick there is maybe there's a, a mental bias. I'm going to resist the temptation to see where it is, but we have one in mind on the art side on technology but that we've been blown away when we met them. And the ability to create art almost on request with workflows across clients, across ourselves, uh, was really blown away. And it's someone who comes from the industry, was frustrated about not getting that typical entrepreneurs. He created his own stuff. We shared with him at the summit. And at the end, we're all looking at each other. That's in the outside. Where, gosh, we need a piece of that one way or the other. Um, so maybe there was a blind spot on that. But one, one maybe thing, we should talk. One thing we are going to do, actually, is um, within our game development studios, um, you know, they, they're constantly trying to solve problems for a particular uh, project or something they're working on. What we probably don't do enough on is share those solutions around the other game development. We were sure. at D3T and they developed a tool that helped alleviate one of the issues on one of their games. And that that sort of technology sort of stayed in the studio. And we're going to do a much better job of sort of cross-fertilizing those solutions across the rest of our studios. Sorry, another one for me. Um, actually, leading off um, the previous question, um, now, you work with game engines across most of your your um, internal game engines with most of your large customers, but Unreal and Unity's game engines sort of growing in terms of their share of games that are created on that. Now, do you think that that actually sort of helps these um, your clients outsource as that sort of level of standardization grows and as a sort of second order effect? Because Unreal is used so much in film and media, do you think that, that, that stand, as standardization grows, that actually opens the door more easily for you to go into those adjacencies? Uh, yes and yes. So I think on the, on the second, I'll take the second one first. Absolutely. I think that's what John was showing. It's really, you've even seen in the footage on virtual production, it's all based on Unreal 5. So it's, if you didn't have that, or you were still in Unreal 2, you could make this happen. So, and you'll see more and more of that. The beauty is not one way to the other. It's not the film industry coming to game. It's games' abilities being able to do films in a very different way. So that's why we absolutely wanted to... Sh- this one is really high up on the list for us. Uh, on the f- first question, if I'm a CEO of uh, big publishers, I would obviously ask myself the question. It's a natural question in many industries. Should I rely on Unity and Unreal, or do I need to have my own game engine? That's where I won't name them, but that's where many are being developed. We are sort of Switzerland on that front. We have the ability to work across all the different engines, it's part of our strengths. We have some customers asking us, which is new to me, that's not in the service lines, but can you help us co-develop the engine so that we keep pace on that front? Again, I'm coming on the 1,500 engineers we have. We have to be thoughtful about what we can do, cannot do. But we, we are sort of that Switzerland. I don't know where it's going to end up. Yes, there are some two very strong ones. Even within those two, there is, they've made different bets. Some are really at the forefront of for AAA. There are some who have pushed a bit more to mobile. There are some that are even starting to look outside of gaming, interestingly, where they, they, they are talking to those retailers I was referring to, saying, can you digitalize my X number of assets? Much lower entry point could be interesting for us as, as part of the academy. So those are things we're looking into. But I think there's a strong, we're well, actually, need, little known fact, but I think we are the biggest developer on both Unity and Unreal uh, in the world, if I'm not mistaken. When you take the aggregate of each of our studios compared to any individual publisher, 
that's a strong position to be on. The, the other thing is, I think it, it sort of potentially lowers the barrier to entry, I think, coming into the industry because a combination of an Unreal and the keywords gives you everything you need to actually produce the game. Whereas if you went back 10 years, you really had to have your own proprietary engine in order to have any chance at all. And there wasn't really a supply side to really support you. So, so I think you know, that, that feels like a good trend for us in terms of uh, our ability to support people that are coming into the industry. A good way to close? It's a nice question. Uh, it may not be a closing question, but it, it can run from Jeffries. I was just going to ask about where are we on the kind of hybrid working, remote working journey? And I'm sure the answer's different for kind of every vertical, but... You want to I, shall I take that? Yeah, I mean, we're, you're right. It's, it's different in, in terms of the different service lines, and it can be different by geography. We got poor old Ashley that's still locked up at home. Um, she couldn't come to the, the last one we did back in February, uh, right at the start of the COVID journey. Um, I think we're trying to keep our options open, honestly, um, uh, and also work with our customers as well, because uh, we need to accommodate how that might change. Uh, at the moment, most of our customers have been very comfortable with the working from home model. Um, as a business, I think we want to retain as much of that as we can. We certainly feel uh, from the feedback we've got from our people that they've enjoyed the flexibility that work uh, working from home provides. But equally, we've got clients and we need to make sure that we're accommodating uh, what they need and they want, particularly in terms of security and the way we used to operate our testing business, for example. So uh, I think we're trying to uh, retain as much flexibility. Um, I don't think it's going to give us a massive cost leverage. I think we're just going to use our footprint in a slightly different way going forwards. Um, what I do think it does is it, it, it de-risks the way that we scale. Uh, Ken, you would have been out in Montreal and you know, in those days, we're trying to predict six months ahead how many seats we needed. We, we, can, we can grow a bit more flexibly now. We can grow into the work from home model, then add footprint when we really know that it's there. So I think it gives us a little bit more operational flexibility. Not many spare seats here today, so you're doing something <laughs> right. Thanks. But on that note, uh, I think except if there are other questions, I, I, I really wanted to thank all of you for spending, I know it's a lot of your time of an entire afternoon with us. So thanks for the investment you're making. Thank you for being with us on that journey. I'm looking at Will, who has been with us. He told me at the break he's been with us pre-IPO already. Uh, but thank you for being on that journey. I think it's going to be a long-term one, and I think it's going to be a hell of a ride as well ahead of us. So thanks for that, and now we can open the bar, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>